Shema!
It was on earlier though. It was weird. It was? Yeah. We tested it. I charged it last week. That's what I thought. I was saying he took it to charge it. Oh. I, mean, I just said that. Maybe it was the uh, the changing of the wires. Uh, they might have turned it off. Sometimes that happens. <clears throat> maybe um, when I had it plugged in ahead of time, maybe it turned off at some point. No, okay. it was off because tur- I had Jen turn it on and we tested it and everything. Hmm. So do I speak now? Or? Oh, okay. We they heard all that. Okay, wonderful. As I was saying, love, love, love. You who is love? As I held this out, the mic for some reason just turned off. Love, love, love. You who is love? And um, we are to uh, show that love too. And I was saying, welcome to Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to all of you who have uh, who are here right now, and those new ones that have joined in the last week. I saw several. And uh, spoke with one in particular. I don't. You've been here before, Kelly, um, out in um, out in Florida, and uh, ho- hopefully you will um, uh, take my invitation that I gave, reached out to you, and get to know some of the sisters in our ministry, uh, and start socializing and uh, fellowshipping with them as well. Um, so glad that those new ones who have come to subscribe are here for uh, many different reasons. And the main reason is that you've come to grow and learn as we in this ministry do our best to separate out all the false lies. Uh, Constantine Christianity, uh, uh, which is the universal uh, circus, um, C-H-U-R-C-H, and... Um, and Babylonian uh, uh, things that have all come in, the chimera of mixtures of everything. And what the Torah is here uh, teaching us is to learn the what is uh, clean and unclean. And so we are separating ourselves out from that, being set apart as Yahuwah is set apart as well. So you're going to get pure word um, um, as Father gives it to me to give to you. And i um, so glad you're here to learn and grow with us. Um, so for those who are new, we're going to, I'm going to uh, share with you how we do our services, just in case you are unaware, which most likely you are. Um, uh, how we do it is I start with some of the announcements now, and then uh, Sister Jeanette will uh, sing Tehillim's 92, which traditionally we do every Shabbat, which a lot of Torah observant people uh, do who call themselves Torah observant. Or Torah trying to observe, you know, people, I hear different things. People say, well, we're trying to, you know, semantics. Uh, so uh, we do that and we give praise to Yahuwah for it is good to give praise to Yahuwah. And uh, she, uh, Father, blessed her with a melody. And so we've been singing it and it's a wonderful thing. Thank you, Sister Jeanette, for allowing Father to use you in such a way. And this is Jennifer is going to, Sister Jennifer is going to come up going too fast slow down uh sister jennifer is going to come up and she's going to uh read uh what we call the covenant the vows the more commonly known as ten commandments the ten words so forth and so on uh and part of that is showing what happens here in discipleship we go to the basics a lot of us are trying to go beyond the basics we feel that we have learned so much in christianity and what all we learned was lies even the basics in uh, Christianity aren't so correct. So we have to get rid of all that, be humble enough to say we know nothing and start all over. And a lot of people, you know, I, I know people who are pastors, uh, and who used to be in Christendom, uh, ex-pastors, I should say. I, I know some who have been, uh, youth pastors and, you know, f- they're hurt that they taught so many lies to people, but it's time to, you know, as Samuel said, or as Yahuwah said to uh, Samuel, uh, how long will you grieve? You know, there's a time to grieve and there's time to get up and active and move forward from that point. We've all made mistakes. We've all been tricked. We've all been hoodwinked. We've all been led astray. We've all been run amok. And Father grabbed us out of all that and now is restoring us um, to his ways, his truth. Um, so we should rejoice in that. And uh, come out of the grieving state into a state of uh, simcha joy as we follow his ways. So uh, so then after that, I'm going to blow the shofar. Usually I blow it uh, sitting here. What I'm finding out is part of the reason why I've been unable to do it is, uh, better is because I'm sitting down. It's a long horn. And so uh, I will be off camera once uh, Sister Jennifer finishes the Ten Commandments and sharing of the uh, Mo'edim. Um, 
the Moedim and then the Moed that's coming up. Yay! Pesach. And then uh, Unleavened Bread, which is a feast. And then we're going to roll into First Fruits. And so um, that's what we'll be learning about today as First Fruits as we enter in on the 14th. Oh, actually, the, the sundown 13th will be the 14th on the Hebrew calendar, on the Abrit, Abrit uh, calendar. And then uh, we will uh, do that. But even before that, we're going to uh, 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 do the covenantal meal, uh, where Yahusha gave the covenant to the disciples, the 12. Hmm, 12 or 11. i got to look at that. Uh, the 12 who were present. Uh, were present with our covenantal meal and he uh, offered the wine and the bread and that's a, a, a marriage proposal um, it's about a marriage proposal so he was uh, given his bride and for those of us who will renew it this year again it's a annual renewal of a dedication uh, to our soon coming uh, husband and to our reigning priest who will be our reigning king all over the whole world but in our hearts he's already is so that's how it starts. And then after I blow the shofar, I will pray over the service, the offering, um, and the uh, praise and thanksgiving that will be given him. And then we'll go, well, I'll come back up and uh, give a little introduction of who we are, what we're about, uh, a little brief lessons on some things um, that are foundational that we need to get in. And, and a lot of people, I do this almost every service. I've been doing it for over two years now in particular. Some of these things over and over and over again, uh, the head of the service. And um, I'm going to tell you, I still get questions about certain things uh, for those who have been watching for years. And so um, this is why it keeps getting repeatedly said because, you know, we we are breed people, uh, Yashraelites. We are very, we easily forget. We get distracted with other things and life and uh, uh sometimes we're still uh in um in the process of releasing our addictions to this world and the many different ways that we are addicted and letting go and not loving this world and so that that kind of i, I can see that it's blocking a lot of fathers things that are not getting in and uh into your very soul into his temple that he's called you to be and so these things are repeated over and over again. Uh, again, I, I will actually ask the question. You can answer that, especially those who have been with this ministry uh, four plus years. Um, do you can you recite the Ten Commandments? Do you know them? Can you go in order? Can you say them verbatim? Yeah, we could all say things like, "Well, that doesn't really matter. I know the gist." Well, that's why we're here today. Because our mother, Hawua, had the gist, and she was just wrong. <laughs> she misquoted, and Hasatan pounced on her without opportunity to misguide her. Um, and some of the very people I've heard say these things, I've watched them go left. That was right, actually. It would go left. I've seen it. Um, so be careful what you say and what you're willing not to do. For you, who uh, you know, we're willing to learn for our jobs, take classes, and and uh, you know, education for this, this, and that for the world. But are we willing to get down and be Bereans and be honorable? The most honorable people mentioned in Scripture. Now, even the Yashraelites, the Abrit people, were uh, called honorable. But the the I almost said Benjaminites, but the Bereans were, and for one reason, one reason alone, because they chose to search out the Scripture to see if what Brother Saul said was true or not and so we, we need to study to show ourselves approved it's in scripture you know we got to get this christianity out of us that once saved always saved oh i accept him i said this prayer and that's it I, i'm home free nope that's not it we we have to show ourselves approved daily every day every moment of the day every choice we make father is recording that he, he's recording what's in our heart as we desire the things of the world and compromise for whatever reasons that we have and try to say things are okay that really aren't and we don't get it and what I feel is this way. And as we have watched uh, many, uh, uh, as you have watched with me in this ministry, uh, the teachings, 
not only of my own, there's been others that I have put here. We know that how we feel is not, isn't what matters. It's how Yahuwah feels. It's how Abba feels. It's how Yahuwah feels about all this. It's Him we are serving. You know, it's, it doesn't matter how you feel uh, at your job. You can say, well, I don't like that I have to come in at 8. I don't like that. That's how you feel. But the requirement is you come in at 8 a.m. That's when you're. That's when it starts for you to start working. Um, so you know we we got to get out of uh, um, always trying to make things comfortable for ourselves and really submit our lives to him. He's you know uh, you guys want to hear me speak a little more differently now because the time is coming up. It's it's right here upon us a lot quicker than you think as the world has changed. Look what happened in a year. Just a COVID situation alone around the world, how quickly everything has changed, has been altered for, it looks like, till Yahushua comes. That's how quick things can change. Fathers, prophetic, uh, if you would just touch the light switch, uh, just gently touch it, it'll turn right off. You don't have to press it, just touch it. Um, yes, there you go. And that, that'll turn right off. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, things are happening. Things are culminating. You know, I, I have a neighbor who is Catholic, and uh, he, he doesn't want it to. There's a lot of you that don't want it to. There's a lot. I'm hearing that from outside and inside. The desire is to continue to live this life the way it is and, you know, get married, have kids, and do this, that, and the other, and please don't come yet. And I'm going to say something I've already said to several people. And if that's you, you're very selfish and self-centered. All the murders, all the abortions, all which is murder as well. All the stuff that's going on in the world right now. The people dying over. And, and you know, the big story right now is the war in the Ukraine. And the people that are suffering there. And the people who have been suffering. The, the stories that we don't get to hear all over the world. And... There is a time frame that's coming to where all those things will be done away with. And you're thinking about yourself. That's not loving others as you love yourself. You wouldn't want these horrible things happen to you. Matter of fact, a lot of us don't even think about these things. We, we try to hide from it. We try to act like everything is great and this world is horrible. And what I mean by world, I'm not talking about the creation of the earth, the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees. That's beautiful. But what Satan has created on this planet is detestable. All the entertainment is detestable. The music is detestable. I woke up this morning and I said to myself, I really hate the music of this world. I actually said that. I said, you know what? I, I, I can feel, I felt it before, but I, the demonic, I feel like as you listen to the music, the demonic hand is just reaching out. To grab and, 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 and choke you and bind you up. None of it is good. None of it glorifies Yahuwah. And you know, Satan's very clever because music can be used in such a way. It, it's something that resonates with us. Music. The vibrations of it. And Father meant it to be, but it's for him. And for a good purpose. So anyway, I've got that soapbox right now. So that's what... Um, uh, how the service is going to run for those who are new. For those who have been here, you understand that already. And, uh, so we'll uh, turn it over to Sister Jeanette so uh, we can sing together. Uh, Tell him Liam's 92. transition it so you don't have to do anything oh, so all oh, you gotta okay. do is just hit play okay. Shabbat Shalom Mishpaka <laughs> okay the Helene Psalms 92 it, it is, is good, good. It, it is, is good, good to, give to give thanks to Yahuwah Yahuwah and to sing 
Sing praises to your name most high. And to declare, declare your kindness in the morning, morning and your trust. Trustworthiness each light of night. On ten strings and on the harp to the sounding chords of the lyre. For you have made me rejoice with your work, O oh, Yahuwah. I shout for joy at the works of your hands, O oh, Yahuwah. How great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know. And a fool does not understand this when the wrong spring like grass and all the workers of wickedness blossom it is for them to be destroyed forever it is good to give thanks to Yahuwah and to sing, sing praises to your name most high. And to declare, declare your kindness in the morning. And your trust, trustworthiness each light of night. But you. Yahuwah, on high forever, for look your enemies. O oh, Yahuwah, for look your enemies do perish. O oh, the work Wickedness are scattered, but you lift up my horn like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil, and my eye looks upon my enemy. My ears hear the evil doers who rise up against me. It is good to give thanks to Yahuwah and to sing. Sing praises to your name most high, and to declare, declare your kindness in the morning, and your trust, trustworthiness each light of night, the righteous one. Flourish just like a palm tree. He grows like a cedar in the Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of Yahuwah flourish in the
the courts of our Elohim. They still bear fruit in knowledge. They are fresh and green to declare that Yahuwah is straight. My rock and in him is no lawlessness. My rock and in him is no lawlessness. To Haley in Psalms 92. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Shalom, everybody. Shemo Exodus 20. And Elohim spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of slavery. You have not our mighty ones against my face. You do not make for yourself a carved image with any likeness which is in the heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, Yahuwah, am a jealous elf, is in the crookedness on the fathers, on the children, to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving commitment to thousands and to those who love me and guard my commands. You do not bring the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim do not, for Yahuwah does not leave the one unpunished who brings his name to not. Remember the Sabbath day to set it apart. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahuwah, your Elohim. You do not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who was within your gates. For in six days you who have made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore you who have blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart. Respect your father and your mother, so your days will be prolonged upon the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim has given you. You do not murder, you do not break wedlock, you do not steal, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. You do not covet your neighbor's house. You do not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. I'm going to be off camera because I need to uh, stand to do a better uh, uh, blowing of the shofar. So I'm going to blow the shofar right now. And hopefully, <laughs> I will be accurate that it will be a better blowing. <laughs> Sort of better, but you can see I hit some of the high note, higher notes. Got three notes now, yay. Improving, improving, improving. Uh, that's all Father wants from us is to improve, right? Mature daily. All right, let's pray. And let's prepare our hearts as we have already entered into his courtyard with praise and thanksgiving. Um, with Simcha with hopefully a cleaner of our mind and a, a full focus on him. Uh, and hopefully we set ourselves in a position to where we will not and cannot be distracted. So let's enter into his realm, into his spiritual realm where he resides. Abinu McCain, our father, who is the creator of all things, we come before you in that understanding and that acknowledgement and the courage to not only in this moment amongst family profess that truth, but amongst those who are not family, and some who are not family yet or don't know they're not, not know they are part of this family. 
and amongst those who jeer, criticize, smirk at the thought of you truly existing. Which is foolishness. How did we get her? That would be like a child saying they had no mother or father. That they just got here. Well, thank you, Father, for pulling us out of that foolishness, that blindness, that retardation. And I'm not saying it in a, in a curse word or it's just a definition. That lack of, of growth and understanding. Thank you for healing our souls to the point that they are right now. We know it's, a, it's, it's something that is going to be continual. Till Yahusha shows up and takes us home. And boy, do we look forward to that day, that time, that hour. We know that we're fastly approaching that season, Father. Please keep our discernment on high alert. Please help your people not to rest. And for those who woke up, to stay awake. For those who are sleeping, to wake up. And stay awake. Father, help us to love one another as, as you have called us to. The additional commandment that Yahushua spoke. Love one another as I, Yahushua speaking, have loved you. Help us to be concerned for one another. Not trying to uh, 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 up one another. Not to try to prove one wrong so that one can be right. But humbly, meekly, correct. In love for the other person. Not to be boastful in oneself that I know so much. Father, we ask for all generational curses to come to end. For we are in unity. We are in intertwined, intertangled with Yahusha, who is the curse breaker. How can his wife be cursed when he is not? Father, help us to be more submitted and more obedient to your word and your ways. Help us to stand firm as the day is getting darker. Let our light shine brighter. Let us reflect you in us more. Let us not draw back, for we are not the type that draw back. But we ever are pushing forward one step at a time as you guide our steps as we don't lean to our own understanding but in all our ways we give it up to you we seek your guidance not our own not our best thinking father a lot of our best thinking has got us into the troubles that we have been in and that we are still crying for you to help us get out of and we've done our best thinking and the results show what our best thinking can do. Father, I want to take this time to give you Toda for all those that you have put on their hearts to be charitable, to have an eye of light, to care for others as you have trained us as you have instructed us as you have commanded us to love the widow the orphan the homeless the fatherless those who are in need and even outside of the realm of what i have just spoken and to have a heart especially for those of us who have plenty not to continue to desire so much more but to give and to recognize that the provisions that we do have don't even really truly belong to us. They belong to you. And to be willing to give the shirt off of our back, the shoes off of our feet. To those who really truly are in need. To be wise as serpents but innocent as doves. When it comes to that, not to be fooled or tricked by those who would take advantage of such things. And again, seeking your face in all things. So, Father, your word says that you would rebuke the devourer on the behalf of those who are to trust in the giving. 
Sometimes we want to hold on to things because we go, I can't give that. Uh, I'm in a situation myself. Father, I've seen your blade. Right now, I'm seeing a blessing in one of our congregants life who is struggling and has been struggling for a long time. And when I encouraged him to give, and he did so, I've seen the blessings come back. Hallelujah. Thank you for you proving your word to be true as we faithfully trust in you and do what you have asked us to do as he did. And I see the rewards coming his way. Hallelujah. They've already started and they seem to continue. They haven't stopped yet. Thank you, Father, for being true. Thank you that when we do what you say to do, it works. And not what we lean and do things our own way. Father, may the praise and thanksgiving that we give you this moment, this yom, be pleasing to you that you would not turn your ear away from it, that it would not be disgusting to you. As I've seen in scripture that you even said, I, 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 I hate your feast days. Because Yahshua was doing them in a state of sin, not in a state of love for you, not in a state of obedience. And Father, may not that be the case here, Father, that you will receive it because we are obedient, because we love you, we're submitting to you. We're not doing this out of religious, uh, 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 ceremonial way to which this is just what we do at this part of this service, Father, but because we can't wait to sing your praises and give you what's due. Like we used to when we were in the world with those who didn't deserve it. For those who never gave us life, for those who never helped us, those we could not even cry out to and ask for help. When we cry out to you, you hear our cries and you answer them. And you tell us to have that expectation of such that the prayers of the righteous, the righteous meaning those who are obedient to your Torah, availeth much. And that we are to expect that when we do pray that you hear, not only that you hear, but that you answer those prayers. And do we have enough evidence here in this ministry of those things? Too many to count. Too many to count over the years. Thank you for continuously staying steadfast in who you are, Father, consistently. And help us to be like you, consistent in our praise, consistent in our obedience, consistent in our submission, consistent in our humility, consistently staying in trust, belief, and faith in you. Father, let everybody be able who hears this now, and to come in the future, may be near or far. Hear these teachings, be fed, let their soul be nourished, let it be repaired, and let it draw closer them who hear this to you. We rebuke the enemy in the name of Yahusha that he would come as your word has warned us. He would come immediately to steal these seeds out. And we say no, that the soil that these seeds land on will be good soil and it would germinate. And these seeds will grow and grow into a mighty tree bearing much fruit for your esteem and your esteem alone. In Yahusha's my name, we declare and decree all these things. Hallelujah. So let it be. So it shall be.
Shalom Mishpacha. I have requested for funding for food here in Pakistan, Mishpacha. Here, Pakistan inflation rate too much increase. Every food items are 50 percent prices increase. So here, too much increase the inflation. So please support us, help us, and do fun for food here in Mishpacha for Pakistan. Thank you so much. Love you.
your name humbly I serve you no matter what I do I will worship you pray be to you Sometimes life can be so cruel. Yeah, yeah. But I know someone that can make it right. Right. What you gotta do is have a little faith. Open up your heart to let him in. Deserve all the praise be to you, be to you, and I magnify your name. Only I serve you. It don't matter what I do. I will worship you. Praise be to you. Your name humbly, yeah, I serve you. No matter what I do, I will praise be to only you, and I magnify your name humbly, yeah, I serve you. No matter what I do, I will worship you. Yahuwah, we love you. You life don't make no sense 
see mankind in your image Oh, oh, oh But yet each man is unique and different You are The creator of creation Oh, oh, oh The ancient of ancients You are Yahuwah This is the album stream version of Praise Be to Yahua from Yahua Acoustics Volume 2. You can support this work by downloading the music on iTunes, Amazon, or Google Play. Praise be to
set apart in your truth. Your word is true. Your word is the truth. Set apart in your truth. Set apart in your truth. There is none like you, oh yeah. Thank you for supporting this work. Get music and motivation for your spiritual journey at setapartheart.com. Who was and dares and dares to come? My Savior King gave His life for me And I know He's coming back to bring me home I know He's coming again I know He's coming again Yes, I know He's coming again I know He's coming again, oh, He's coming again, He's coming again. comes again Then we'll sing some more We'll keep on singing till He comes again Until we reach the golden shores We'll keep on singing till He comes again Then we'll sing some more We'll keep on singing till He comes again Then we'll sing forevermore Rejected, rejected. World is you, you notice in the best 
This is Zion forever, impossible to keep us bound, Delilah, not a dragon, I spit fire, came up higher, driven in his hand, got a change of attire, running straight, not a slider, no time to blend, running strong, air lift in the end, check it, yeah.
Abba Father, we thank you for your Son, your only begotten. And may his selfless sacrifice be never forgotten. We thank you for allowing his blood to atone. And we thank you for tearing the veil so that we can step before the throne and worship our Abba Father, we thank you for your painful loss And thank you for giving him the keys of sin and death after he died We thank you for allowing his blood to atone And we thank you for tearing the veil So that we can step before the throne And worship our king Okay.
focus your mind Let the sun rise, how the bar don't lie Higher, this my aim and purpose Take aim, come up thoughts, I tell you the work The swall of the raw, true system, the sun Seven gold is not my trust Can you see them now? Can you see them now? Take those thoughts and cast them down Now my power
All right, I hope you enjoy that phrase of Thanksgiving. Uh, I'm very joyful right now. I have a lot of simcha <laughs> um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you got to be careful what you say because it might happen. <laughs> I had a little funny story to share. I'm overjoyed with two things. Our dear brother Daniel was <laughs> talking about how his dog was lazy and how uh, <laughs> it, it, won't, it won't water the grass and anything. <laughs> He came out, the water was on, and only the dog was in the backyard. <laughs> so, be careful what you say. <laughs> and also, for Brother Daniel, too, his daughter's um, molar was swollen. And he put on praise music. We prayed as a ministry together, as Mishmachah, as family. And guess what happened? A miracle. Her, 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 her um, the inflammation is gone. Now, see... This is what I'm trying to share with, with you guys. Father is real. He's no joke. And either we're going to get on board and get these blessings. This lack of faith, y'all got to stop this. He's real. He's active. He's alive. And he's sitting there waiting to just bless his children who will have belief and trust in him. And y'all are missing out when you doubt. It can't be no, not even a little bit of doubt. All right. So if you need a full blessing, say, I'm gonna get kicked out your house. The light bills going off. You got medical bills. You, you you will get according to your belief. If it's a little bit of belief, you're gonna get a little bit. If you, if you believe 100%, you're gonna get 100% relief. You're gonna get 100% relief on whatever that is. You just gotta wait on his time, and he may test you. He may try you. Know that that's happening. That's what he does in scripture, and you will be eventually blessed because he's not a liar he's not a man that should lie nor a son of man that he shall repent has he not said and will it not be so that's a scripture he's true so we got to be patient on him and wait he's testing us see we gotta understand the position we think we're testing him no he's testing us to see if we're faithful to him and his kingdom and as we stay faithful no matter what even in the Face of death. Oh, yeah. Looks like I'm getting ready to die. Oh, well, I'm going to give up right now. That's the wrong time to give up. That's the wrong time. That's the time to say, well, I'm almost dead anyway. I'm going to keep believing in it. I'm guaranteed I might be seeing him very soon. Now, let me clarify that statement, seeing him very soon. I don't, because when you go to sleep, you wake up and you, you don't know time, right? So everybody who dies is just going to wake up and they're going to see you who is going to be like that to them. So that's what I mean. I don't mean there's no soul sleep and waiting for the time when those who are resurrected shall be resurrected. I'm not saying that. Just want to give some clarity. All right. We are Lined Away Ministries uh, International. And why are we international? Well, one, we have many viewers from all over the world. And many uh, uh, those who have decided uh, through the guidance of Yahuwah's Ruach, set apart spirit to join us as Mishpacha, uh, led them here. And so we, we have brothers and sisters from all different uh, nations and uh, ethnic groups and people groups. And we embrace everyone. Um, we embrace what the word says. A mixed multitude did come out of Mitzrayim. Uh, those who weren't genetic Abrit, Abrit people. And so uh, that was Father's plan from the beginning. And so we don't sit here and say, no matter who the chosen people truly are, which I think that's very important to understand for a lot of reasons, because if it was important to hide that fact, that uh, there must be an importance to that fact. Does that not just make sense? Why did Hasatan go through all this effort to lie about that and deceive and redirect attention somewhere else? Uh, so it is very important, and some of us still have some issues with uh, understanding importance. Besides that, it, besides that understanding and getting to that understanding, we receive everybody. Anybody who's desiring to uh, uh, be in covenant with Father and follow His ways is a brother, is an ak, is an akati, is a sister to me, and we're all in this together to help one another. And again. love one another oh, oh it's coming back by again oh here we go <laughs> Woo! just in case you didn't see it there it is love 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 
Okay, so uh, uh, we, we, we uh, as Sister Jeanette uh, had a dream, Father spoke to her through that dream that we were going to be on the continent of um, India, and I said, okay, if that's what Father says, I'm here to receive that, and uh, Pastor P showed up first, who is an older gentleman, out there with now a very bolstering and uh, I don't want to say huge ministry, but active ministry, I think, is more the word. Uh, thank you, Yahuwah. Uh, active ministry. It, it's moving. It's grooving. It's, it, it, it's, yeah, it's growing and has grown tremendously. Thank you for your support that you've given us uh, so that we can send that support to him. And uh, he's doing very well at this point, that ministry, uh, servicing the communities that he services. Um, we service the widows and orphans there. We service uh, the general public as well uh through uh well water and digging of wells and repairing well, well motors we've helped them purchase a building one side houses the widows the other side the orphans and it's a complete family with the men as elders and the ones who have both sides who don't have any family the females who are the widows and the children and now we got a complete family see father restores he'll bring what you don't have he's done that in my own personal life i i haven't been able to raise children from birth up Yet he gave me many children from birth up to uh, uh, be a part of that. Um, the last one, I was at the hospital um, and, and was there and got and was the first one out of even the, the DNA family to hold the baby for the first time, baby Gigi. And, um, and so uh, Father does these things, these things that I didn't get to do and desire to do deeply. Uh, that's not for me now. But I get to live it through other people. And so I praise him for that. And he will do the same for you. These things that uh, you feel you may have missed in your life due to whatever situation. I was married too young or I didn't get married soon enough or uh, I physically am not able to have a child. Um, Father can restore that too as well. Uh, whatever it is, whatever it is, he will restore that in the way that he does and and it, it'll be a marvelous, wonderful thing. He does hear the cry of his people. One thing I do want to express before I move on, um, that song uh, where, uh, what's her name? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Adara. Adara, thank you. Adara, she's saying, um, if my people will humble themselves and pray. And then she starts saying, heal our land, heal our, heal our land. And you know what I heard? I heard it's not about your nation that you're in right now. That's not the land that he's going to heal. He will heal that, but he's talking about Yasharal. Because that land is desolate. No, it's not. There's people over there. That's not the place I'm talking about. I'm talking about the real Yasharal. Because scripture tells us that it's desolate. Uh, 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 there's jackals running around. Uh, it's a deserted place. Uh, that's part of the punishment. The, that land is kept. Nobody is there. According to scripture. Even the Hasidic Jews know that. And that's why they seem to be traitors to the nation. The other Jews call them traitors to the nation because they go, we're not supposed to be here. But they don't even realize that's not even really the land. That place called Palestine is not the land. Um, and so, uh, I know, I know. Uh, contact me. We'll talk about that. And uh, I'll give you some information that you can then look over and pray yourself. But it's very clear in scripture. Um, that's part of the punishment that we don't have a land and nobody else can reside there. He's keeping it on hold so that when Yahusha comes back to this Aretz, this earth, he will restore um, that place and it will become his kingdom here on earth as well as what is already in the Shamayim. And then uh, you, you knew Jerusalem as well as where we will reside, um, which will be above the earth. That's in Hazan and so forth and so on. So uh, continuing with Pastor P, he goes to uh, uh, the leopards as well. We service them with love. Oh, wait a minute. What? Love. Oh, it's this weird thing. It just keeps coming back by. Love. And we show them that they're worthy of that. As we are. Just because of their position. And you know, in India, they have a, if you don't know, they have a, uh, a caste system. And once you're cast in it, that's it. You're born into it. You can't get out of it. Well, that's man's system. That's not Yahuwah's system. And everybody in Yahuwah's system is worthy of love, compassion, uh, to be taken care of, uh, uh, just to be shown that they're, they're creating the image of Yahuwah. 
and we should acknowledge when we look at each other, that's what we should say. And then, uh, of course, we got Pastor Tamor, uh, my, my Ak. I love him so much over there, fighting the good fight of the uh, of Yahuwah over there against uh, much pressure, much great adversity. And uh, even though being a young man, you know, he's definitely uh, has the Ruach of King Dawood, um, that understanding of who his Abba is and who he is to him, and therefore he can stand in that acknowledgement. And he has and he does. Um, no matter what has happened, even more recently, we've had the, the circus come after our people, after the women and children physically, uh, uh, physically tried to cause harm. Uh, to them, uh, yeah, Christians, right, yeah, and so, um, which, which is actually historically accurate, that's what they've been doing to us, and stole our identity, and then rewrote books, because the victor, to the victor goes, uh, uh, writes the history, the victor writes the history, so uh, they put their uh, uh, name in our place, even though if you look at their history, you will see, as I will uh, read again, as I do uh, every Shabbat, just about every Shabbat, um, the history of our force of their fourth century uh, circus leader, and what he had to say about these people who are not Zerim, and so um, and who who they were. He did, he makes a distinction between them and, and between us and them. So uh, this is something we have to renew our minds to to this truth. All right. So, uh, but brother, uh, going back to uh, Pastor Tamor. Uh, he's out there being in the streets under death threats, um, uh, being relocated, uh, physical harm, and such. Uh, thank goodness Father has given us the ear, this ministry, and, and Pastor Tamor, um, the uh, Prime Minister's ear. And uh, several years ago, he made a proclamation about us in that country that we were the only ones following the scriptures correctly. As I got the opportunity to speak with him many years ago, uh, I can't remember how long ago now, uh, three, four years ago now, and uh, Father even gave me a verse from the Quran, believe it or not, and it, the Quran, Muhammad said that Yasharal is Yahuwah's people, and to help them, when I read that to them, you should have saw it's on video, and they're going like this, and they're talking, you know, to each other. And, and I, what I did realize that behind the uh, the video were all the other religious leaders of their country, the heads of their country. So they all heard that, and uh, there was a lot of mumbling and so forth and so on. And then they said, uh, "We'll meet again the next Thursday, which is uh, the uh, fifth day of the week." Um, for those who don't know that, um, that day is named after T H O R uh, T H O R. That's his day, and his mother is the next day. So that's why we here in this ministry have chosen um, uh, not to uh, speak those words. I, I did that because we have some new people um, that have. I, I don't know where you're at in that, so it's teaching purposes. So you may hear or see me sp uh, spell some words. Or call different words like the C H U R C H. I'm going to call the circus because that is the definition of it, um, and such. And uh, so, uh, uh, so again, it's really real threats, and we've had favor amongst the government because uh, we're there to be good citizens within, as we are here and everywhere you are at. We're to be good, uh, good uh, uh, residents. Um, as we sojourner through these lands, and if we're sojourners as Kifa, our elder, our uh, one of the emissaries who was right next close to him said, "That's we're journeying through these lands." And then where are we going? Where are we headed towards? I think we need to really understand that we're headed towards the the New Jerusalem. This, we're headed towards Yahusha and where he will be. You know, a, a, a husband and wife reside in the same home. Is that not true? So wherever he is, we shall be. And we know where he is going to be. And we know where he is now. In the Ruach, we should be there with him. And in the natural, we'll be there with him as well. Okay. And thank you for all your support. Um, 
and we're gonna actually I'm gonna the video I played last week we're gonna play again and this is a uh, uh, pastor Tamor um, making a request this is an additional offering there was some confusion about that if you send an offering um, I, I there's a regular offering we support about a thousand plus people over there in Pakistan how do we support them by their basic needs we're talking about food we're talking about clean water we're talking about clothing we're talking about uh we paid for a medical bill um uh, for a young man who was having uh, problems with his breathing and uh, had to go to surgery um, in this case uh and so we we helped pay for that as well and so all all these things you know so father does miracles absolutely and then there's times where he I, I believe he allows things to take place to see if we have an evil eye or if we have a good eye evil is dysfunctional not being charitable that's the dark eye the light eye is functional and charitable and you know we have to exercise he's going to say and see if we not only are speaking his word but are we living it out are we actually living it out do we care for others as we care for ourselves what would we want if we were in a situation where we weren't able to have the funds? We didn't have the funds and something came up that we needed funds for that was crucial for living life. Or living it maybe a little more comfortable in the sense of, you know, phys physically. And so, uh, Father's going to test his people in these ways. He's going to test to see where we're at. So, uh, here's uh, uh, Pastor Tamora. And after he speaks, I, I will uh, explain it because uh, the language is a little bit different. Jeanette, do you think it's going to go through the speakers this time? I know last week it was a little different. No, because you played. Mm. Okay. Wait for mm. Nana to come back. Because the connection is successful. I don't think you need to okay. reset the stream key. I'm back. So we're back. Um, so they're just seeing you this time. Can you hear me? Okay, great. We had some. We lost, uh, internet. We lost internet. We had some technical difficulties. So now we're gonna we're gonna go back to uh, uh, Pastor Tamor, and uh, we'll we'll have him hear this. Um, Hold on again. Okay. We're making. Sure. It was working on OBS, but I don't think they used to. Here we go. All right, we're good. Okay, we're all hundred percent good. Okay, all right. Forgive us for that. We was out of our control. The internet took a dive, and now we're back. We don't know why, but we're back. So, uh, I was. Uh, what did they hear? The what did they hear, and what did they not hear? They didn't hear none of him. None of him, but me up to that point. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Pastor Tamar is here as of last week, uh, making a request for uh, funds for. Uh, uh, motorcycles because gas prices as we all know are up especially here in california Woo and um and uh it, it just makes more sense to uh, the people of the the modes of transportation that are out there that we paid for are not astronomically high astronomically high and uh so if he had a motorcycle that would solve a lot of that it doesn't take up a lot of gas and uh because we're spending a lot of money now on transportation getting to the other congregations um, that could be spent much better um, providing the food and so that means we need to send more and that means we need more coming in so this this is uh, 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 last week there was some confusion some people sent in their regular offering and again I want to stress that that regular offering is for their basic needs clothing food uh, improvement of shelters um, of their homes um, one day I may uh, as a robot guys may show you guys some of their living situations of those who are in our congregation I remember the first time Tamor sent those pictures to me it broke my heart I couldn't even sleep that night tears were coming down my face uh, seeing a, a, a child's room um, looking like an open cubicle with these sticks um, there was it was brick brick it was opening and it was these two sticks with a, this flappy not even a thick fabric on top that was their uh, uh, covering and uh, you know to see you know here we're so uh, spoiled um, absolutely we have so much and um, you know it's cold over there and it's hot over there so you have these extremes 
Um, so uh, here we are. We're going to start this all over again and uh, let you hear from Minister uh, Pastor Tamar himself. Uh, for some reason, it doesn't go through on here, but so I'm going to hold it up to the mic. Okay. Shabbat Shalom. I have again the question for Bike here in Ministry of Pakistan. Reason is that is an influence of um, rates in fuels, um, petrol, gases. So public transport fares too much increase as like before year. So please support for bike. Then uh, our transport expense will decrease. So thank you so much. I have attached the video of bike with that. Thank you. Okay, so that is the uh, bike that he's looking to buy. It's a thousand dollars, and so we're looking to raise money for that as quickly as possible. Um, you know, it just you know, if a thousand people would give a dollar, that's all it would take. If a thousand people would just give a dollar. Uh, so please contact us. Hopefully, we were, we're looking um, to uh, have a button for you um, from this point on to give offerings as well as uh, additional offerings for things that come up. Like Hezekiah had to ask for additional offering for things outside of the regular offerings. And uh, let's show our love. Let's show our love. I don't know if you understood everything he said, but the petrol, they call it petrol, um, petroleum, um, gas prices have gone up dramatically over there. It costs so much for public transportation, uh, and it would be a lesser cost to uh, get the bike and, 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 you know, fill up himself and go. So, again, this is for ministry. This bike will be the uh, Light Away Ministry Pakistan's motorcycle. Um, for ministry work and so uh, if father uh, leads your heart to do that please do and have a eye of light or functional eye not the eye of darkness again if you know uh, there's about seven over 700 subscribers right now was it eight eight something uh, it might be eight something by now and again uh, with that many people if, if two people if, if everybody would give two dollars we, we got it. A dollar fifty. We, we got the money and we can do that quickly. Um, so just really think about that. We're not asking for a strategy. We're not asking for billions of dollars or millions of dollars. And we're not asking for you to break the bank as well. Again, when spread out amongst us, we can get this done. We can get this done. So uh, really please pray. And, and, you know, sometimes definitely pray and seek Father if, if you must. But there's certain things Father has told us to do. We don't really, do we need to pray about that? Do we really need to pray to feed somebody? Oh, somebody's talking, hold on, man, let me pray about that. Somebody's shivering cold. Well, let me pray about getting them a blanket. Or, or, or you know, do we, all, we should already know this is elementary things. Elementary. This is baby stuff. Two plus two is four. You know, uh, let us love one another. Let us love and care for each other. So, and this is about spreading the, what? The good news. This is to help to do that. You know, we, we stand here on the western side, very, we're this, we're that. And uh, when pressed, sometimes we, we don't live up to what we claim we are. Now, I'm not saying everybody, but there are many of those who don't. So, let's live up to what we claim that we are. Let's not just give lip service. Let's do it. Let's, let's get it done. So that our brother can continue to do the marvelous work he's doing out there. Um, you know, he was, uh, oh, that's why I didn't do it. But next week, I'm going to show you how he, um, 
He's been training the children with uh, singing songs for Pesach and things of this nature. He's he's putting his life on the line, um, as I already stated, uh, in, even unto death. You know, the threat of death. His life is about this ministry, not this ministry, Yahuwah's ministry, Yahushua's ministry. He happens to be part of this ministry. Hallelujah. And I'm very glad to be working side by side with, with him. Um, you know, if you're in a war, he's definitely somebody you want by your side. He's fearless. He's humble. He takes orders very well. He submits. Uh, 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 and he's right there day and night if needed. So, uh, again, uh, really search yourself. A dollar fifty, a dollar twenty-five. Can you actually do that? Of course you can. Of course you can. And as I stated earlier, as there's a brother in our ministry who uh, ha has, you know, felt well. I don't know if he felt, but was, you know, very uh, financially strapped. And uh, Father spoke to me to speak to him about giving, even in that condition. And so he did. And you know gave an amount that uh he really could have used you know you, you we could say widow's might if you will and i'm watching now the blessings that are coming forth onto him and they keep coming and they keep coming and i know it's from that because father spoke to me and said he was father was waiting there to bless him but he had to give first some of you are waiting for some things and some of you are missing this part of giving of giving it's not just prayer it's not just fasting. It's not just reading the word. It's not just knowing the Hebrew. It's not just knowing his name. It's all these things coming together. You know, I've counseled many husbands and wives, and uh, mostly you hear this from the wives, you know, the, they would like more affection. And sometimes you hear from the husbands, well, don't I pay the rent, and don't I do this, and don't I do that? Isn't that enough? Doesn't that show that I love you? And, you know, from a man's perspective, no, we are different. You know, men and women are, are different, yet there's so much the same. And what we have to do is submit to the other one's needs. The Father submits to our needs. The word bless, Baruch, in Hebrew, is the image. The picture of it is someone kneeling down on their knees, handing a gift. Yahuwah says that he wants to Baruch you. Baruch you. So the image is the creator of all things, our father, who's in the Shamayim, to kneel down and hand you a gift. Every time I think about that, it does something that stirs something up inside of me. Because it's beautiful. He humbles himself. Think about it, parents, especially you parents. Are you not serving your children? Think about it. I'm hungry. I need clothes. I need this. I need that. But you're the authority. But you're serving your children. You're serving and giving them the needs and sometimes their wants. And this is what Father's doing to us, and we should do the same for others. So, okay. So, uh, Father's been having me uh, for the last uh, year now, I think. Hmm. Did you see that water just squirt all up on my nose? Um, to start uh, sharing what he, this uh, ministry, what he gave us in the beginning of this ministry, this, our foundational scriptures and what we're doing. And so, Yahu, Jeremiah 6.16, Thus says Yahuwah, stand in the ways to rock and see and ask for the old or ancient paths, the rock, where the good, functional, there's no word for good in the Hebrew. That's a Greco-Roman concept. Father says it's functional or dysfunctional. So wherever you see the word good or wicked or evil, the good is functional. The wicked or evil is dysfunctional. Remember, he's a creator. He's looking at his creation and say what works and doesn't work. It, it really makes sense. Where the good, the functional way is. And walk in it. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to live it out, walk in that, with the functional ways, and find rest for yourself. When we're dysfunctional, we don't find rest. Have you ever seen a dysfunctional person? You may be looking at, you may be looking at yourself in the mirror and say, "Yeah, that's a dysfunctional person." And to some degree, we all are dysfunctional according to Yahuwah's ways. 
And so we don't want to be called dysfunctional. When somebody calls you, yo, you're dysfunctional, boy. People's feathers get ruffled because that's not a good thing. That's the only place we can find rest. When you're dysfunctional, there's no rest. There's no rest inside here. That's shalom. That father says is beyond all understanding, can't reside in a dysfunctional person. So then later he uh, accompanied it later on in the ministry with this uh, verse, Romans, Romain uh, 12, 1 through 2. And I, I, you know, as I read this, I really feel uh, I'm saying this as well. I really am. This is my heart. I call upon you, therefore, brothers, through the compassion of Yahuwah, to present your to present your bodies a living offering. I'm talking to those who are covenant. I'm talking about those who have been immersed. I'm talking about those that say that they hear from the Ruah. Present your bodies as a living offering. Set apart. Set apart from what? From the things the world does. Too many things we still want to be a part of with the world. And we rationalize. Well, it doesn't say directly in scripture this. So why are you saying that that's not unpleasing the Father? Well, where did it originate? Did it originate in scripture? Did it originate outside of scripture? Did it originate outside of his people, his chosen people? If it does, then therefore we are not to do it. Did his chosen people, who are supposed to be the example for us, did they do it? If the answer is no, then we don't do it. It's really simple. A lot of people are wrestling and fighting because they still love the the witchcraft. They still love the witch. It still has a hold. They haven't been delivered yet from it. They're still crying out for Mitzrayim. Why are we out here in the wilderness? Because we are in the wilderness as we start drawing her through this wilderness. And when I could be where I used to be, where there was leeks and watermelons and quail and meat and all that type of stuff, yet I'm being fed from the Shamaim, this what? What is this? And Father's humor said that's exactly what it is. You called it. What is this? That's what manna means. It's Malachim food. Wow, we get to eat what the Malachim got to eat? Interesting, by the way. The Malachim eat. Ah, anyway, let's continue. Set apart, well pleasing to Yahuwah, your reasonable worship. It's just reasonable. It's just reasonable. It's not unreasonable. It's reasonable. Some of us, I've heard those who act and proclaim like it's so unreasonable. This is ridiculous. This is a way of expressing love. Well, is that the way Father says to express love? And who comes first? Last night at our Torah reading, we were reading um, the last part of uh, Debraim and finish that off as we restart the cycle um, next, next uh, uh, Shabbat evening, which is the beginning of Shabbat, which is on the uh, uh, sixth day going into the seventh. And what did we read? We read that the priest... Had no care. Now you gotta understand how Hebrew, the the Brit language speaks. Had no care for their children, for their wives. They served father fully and utterly. That doesn't mean they didn't take care of their wives and their families, because that was Torah instruction as well. Did you notice I just said Torah instruction? Guess what I just said. Does anybody know shrimp scampi? What that really means? Shrimp is shrimp. Scampi is shrimp too. Shrimp, shrimp. I just said instruction, instruction. Or I just said Torah and Torah. Just wanted to put that out there. And what does he say to do? We're supposed to follow the Torah instructions were for men to take care of their families and they've got to guide their children. Right? So it wasn't that they neglected their wives. It wasn't that they neglected their children. But who was first? Yahuwah. And their duties to Yahuwah. And if you have family members, if it was a wife or children that would try to come in between that, they did never allow that. Matter of fact, I don't think there's anything in scripture, except for maybe one priest who allowed his two sons to uh, uh, fraternize and eat the, the, the portions of sacrificed meat that they weren't supposed to. And they were sleeping around with the women. Um, and that, that's the only time I've ever heard of that. Outside of that. I don't believe, and please correct me if there is another time, please let me know, where a, a, a priest uh, uh, allowed their family to come in between them and Yahuwah. The rest of them never did that. There, there's no recorded history that I'm aware of. 
And so that's where we're supposed to be walking this walk. We're priests, kings. It's funny, priests is first. We're priests, kings. And so priest life is dedicated fully to Yahuwah. Not to a mate, not to the children, and not to their family, to Yahuwah first. So inside yourselves as priest, kings, and training, you've got to understand that. And if any of you are in a place where that's not so, you're out of alignment. You come to every service. You can get all the insight. You can speak that insight. It, it can be functional insight. But if Father is not first in every area, we read where Yahushua said, if you're not worthy of me, unless he is first. And we know that Yahushua is Yahuwah. This ministry believes that. We proclaim it. Read Johannes or John chapter 1 and replace uh, whatever word is there if you are still reading uh, the old ways the G-O-D word put Yahuwah there if you if if, if you put Yahuwah there put uh, it says it says uh, Elohim or Elohim put Yahuwah there and then read it and see what you get hold on to your head it might blow it off hold on and do not be conformed to this world. Whatever the world is doing, don't do it. Whatever they love, don't do it. But be transformed. No change. Because you can change back. Too many people change for a season. They change right back. And you see them. You go, wow, how'd they fall out like that? Because they didn't transform. They changed. There's a difference between changing and transforming. Transforming, you can never go back. Changing, you can go back. So for those of you out there, if you're going to be honest and look in the mirror, those of you who have gone back, you didn't transform. You weren't even in the process of transforming. Because once you start the process, you can't go back. You're transforming. See? All right. So case in point. Can a caterpillar, once the transformation process stops, stop the transformation and go back to a caterpillar? No. Once it starts... It starts. It's done. It's just going to take the time to which it reaches its maturity in that new transformed state and emerge. So some of you haven't even started. But Pastor, I've been, I've been, you know, with you who attend 15, 20, 30 years. Okay. That doesn't mean you're in a transformation state. That doesn't necessarily mean that. We have chronological people who are chronological adults. And you know some, and it may be you. <laughs> if you don't know any, you might want to look in the mirror. <laughs> and they're not adults. They're not mature people. But they should be according to their age. The truth is, they're not, for whatever reason. Don't even need to know the reason. That's not what I'm discussing right now. So we say certain things as as a length of time is uh, uh, the only marker. No, it's not. It can be. It can be one of them. But it's not an absolute. There is a character. There is a way of being and portraying oneself. The fruit that comes off. Is it good, functional, or is it bad? Dysfunctional. Then you will know. Okay. And do not conform. Be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. You've got to get your mind renewed. You can't continue to do the old ways. Some of you are still doing the old ways and they're not working. And somehow, I don't know if it's a stubbornness. I don't know if it's, uh, I just give up. I don't know what it is. You would have to determine that. But I just tell you what I see. People try Father's ways just for a little bit. And when it doesn't give that automatic satisfaction that this world has been accustomed to which is demonic I'll tell you it's demonic because if you look at father's nature nothing happens like that a woman gets pregnant and she doesn't give birth nine months or so later right fruit trees they have to get to a maturity first you don't even get good fruit until around the fourth fifth sixth year of fruit trees 
when I plant seeds and I plant uh, whatever, zucchinis and tomatoes and watermelons and onion, they didn't all just, the next day I came out or three days later, none of them, that never happened. All of them took time, two weeks, 30 days, 56 days, depending. Then things got going, you have to wait, you have to wait till it works. See what you're saying when you give up quick, you're saying father's ways don't work. You're bearing false witness. You don't have the trust, faith, and belief in, in him. And then you wonder why things aren't working. And all that opens doors to the demonic to continue to operate in your life. You can't have simcha. You can't have joy. You can't have peace. You can't have rest in him. How can you? When you're not walking in full faith. You don't believe. You don't truly believe. So... It's by the renewing of our mind. We have to renew our mind to that so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Yahuwah. Please don't stop. Continue. There's people, I think I said it last week, or I can't remember if it was one of the studies last week. There was a woman on Facebook um, that I, I, I'm friends with. I, I don't even think I talked to her that much because I'm not on Facebook as much anymore. 30 years of this walk in Torah. Then her family came in. 30 years. But they were steadfast. Her and her husband were steadfast. They didn't waver. They continued to mature. And as the family watched, 30 years. Some of you don't even last a month. Some of you don't last a year. Before you throw your hands up. They're not listening to me. They're not changing. Whatever. Well, don't worry about that. You change. You keep going. Why is that causing you to come out the face? So why are you here in the first place? Just so if they don't come in, then you aren't going to, you're going to go back and join them? So again, where's the love for Father? Here we are again. We're back to where is your allegiance? Why did you really do this? Why are you really here? It's going to be of no avail for you in the end. See, I'm a watchman, so I have to warn you. Time is getting short. Yahusha, I, I, I can smell him. That's how close he is. I can smell his aroma. I'm looking at the season, the time. I'm watching the news. And I'm going to pause there just for a moment. I, I want to say, uh, I want to give out prayers and condolences to those who uh, lost loved ones in that sacramental shooting. And here we are. It was 2 o'clock a.m. at a bar, alcohol, you know that was there. There may have been some drugs involved. Father and people, those who lost those uh, their loved ones in that situation, some may be saying, or may be angry with our Heavenly Father. Why did he allow this to happen? What did he say? Don't get drunk. You know what, you know what the human saying is? Nothing happens good past 12. We, we're children of the light. We're supposed to be in bed sleep. If anything, we're supposed to be praying at the midnight hour, right? We're supposed to be in prayer. If we're going to be up. Not being in situations that foster situations like this. So I want to give my condolences to those families. We are praying for your comfort. We do care for you. We also know that it's not Father's fault. He doesn't stop sin like that. He asks us to stop it. Please don't do that. Don't put yourself in a situation where Hasatan can get in there and in your weakness cause you to do something. Take lives. Take lives. We have to be transformed by the renewal of our minds so that we prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Yahuwah. Are you proving that in your life? See, a lot of us are speaking words. Oh, you're saying the wrong word. You use G-O-D and blah, 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 and this, this, and that, and you're doing Christmas, which is a birthday, by the way. Just want to mention that. And you're doing this, that, and the other. And all they want to really see is your life change. That's what they really they want to see is it sincere. Some of us have been flipping and flopping back and forth from this to that to that to this. And our friends and families and associates 
and acquaintances have all seen us flip back. And now we're in this weird thing. Wait, this is one of the weirdest things they've done yet. Oh, you're not doing what? What kind of language are you speaking? Yahuwah, what? Who is who? What do you mean he's not JC? Oh, oh, wow. So you can't do anything on the seventh day. Can't even cook. Wait, oh, what is this year in? Okay. So you got you got to be honest about your life. No wonder why people aren't listening. Be honest about what you have been and what you may still be doing or not doing. Actions speak loud in words. You know what people want to see? Consistency. You know when everybody stopped harassing me? I don't get harassed anymore by anybody I've known because they've seen a consistent walk. Again, this isn't patting myself on the back. Please don't take it that way. It's just giving you an example in my own personal life. I've been walking this walk now since 2010 in particular when Father told me I was a Nazarene. And I said, well, I'm a Nazarene. Okay. I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a Christian. And I started researching that and looking into that and getting that understanding and, and what he was looking at me to behave and be like. And as I consistently did that, then people started to stop poking fun. They said, oh, okay, he doesn't do this, he doesn't do that. Okay, this is his life. This, he's really doing it. From clients to others. And th I'm telling you, if there, if there are those around you and you've been doing this for a long time and they're still looking at you kind of cross-eyed and they haven't really calmed down too much about what you're doing, nor are they even considering coming in, you may want to examine, are you really walking this walk? Or have they watched you compromise here and there? And they watch you do this, and they watch you do that, and they go, hmm. They are watching, I promise you that. They're watching to see what you're about. We're first century disciples of the 21st century. What does that mean? Well, we have technology. Obviously, our technology went out, a Wi-Fi. <laughs> if you were here earlier, you know that went out, so we're doing uh, uh, technology. So we're not Amish. We're not uh, saying that we don't like that. We uh, A lot of us have cars and phones and iPads and computers, home computers. and so We may have to have a job that requires technology. That's not what we're speaking about. When it comes to what the world calls religion, which we are not, um, we're living the way of life. That's not a religion. Just like the like the manual of a car is not a religion because you follow it. And you follow what it says to take care of your car. Well, we have a book. It's called the scriptures, the writings, the prophets, and the rest of it. Um, to where Father has given us instructions on how to live this life that he's given us. To live for him. And so we follow that. Without any add-ons. We don't do Constantine Christianity. We don't do any add-ons from Babylonia. We don't do any add-ons from anything. We don't mix it up. We don't say that we're not we're Nazarene and we want to stretch, so we're going to do Nazarene yoga. We don't do that. Even the Buddhists are upset about that with those who are in the circus who are doing that because they say you can't do it without being one. Yeah. I cannot commit a crime and then say I'm not a criminal. So when you practice these things, but it's stretching, then stretch. Ain't nobody, leave that, keep that word out your mouth. Do you know I won't buy mats? I was looking for a mat, exercise mat, and tons of them had that word. A yoga mat, yoga mat, yoga mat, yoga. I said, nope, 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 nope. Found one that said exercise mat. Looked at all the stuff, the people who were selling it, didn't see anything like that. Boom, bought that one. We're lackadaisical. We're laying things into our lives. And, and Hasatan knows we are because he's helped us become that. He set it up for you to be lazy. You've fallen into his trap. You've been snared by it. And you're okay with it. So we're not doing any of that. No, we don't celebrate birthdays. Absolutely not. We don't celebrate Yahusha's day of birth. We don't even know it. And we're definitely not doing it on the day that another deity day is. 
No, we don't do any of that stuff. Only what's in scripture, what we have been instructed to do, and we have been instructed not to do those things. So we are unlearning many things and relearning things. We have had to humble ourselves and not be prideful and go, well, I spent this much time. Some, some people get angry and, and, and distorted because, you know, they've been lied to and they believed it, hook, line, and sinker. Get over that. Go through your emotions and get over that and, and put that energy towards the truth of his word and relearn and relearn these things. And as a research team, we're looking for our brothers and sisters, our Ak and Akatees out there who don't know that there are Ak and Akatees, that they've been stabbed from the foundation of the earth because Father knew that they were going to be with him. And so he sent out us, not just this ministry, us as the body of Mashiach to go out into the world, uh, uh, spread the good news. And those who receive it are the ones who have received the mark. The mark was already there before the foundation of the earth. And just waiting for them to get here and to then follow through with the rest of what they were going to do anyway. So that's what we're doing. That's our part with Father. We're joining him in doing that. Okay. Yeshaya, Isaiah 8, 20. This is a very important scripture. This is why they don't want you reading the, the, what they call the Old Testament. You know, it's just the First Testament and the fulfillment of the First Testament, which they call the Second Testament. The first testament has to deal with what? Mainly the Mashiach and his coming the first time and second time. And we get to be in the second part of that, uh, 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 of those uh, prophetic words, his return. And uh, that's wonderful that we're at this time. So we, we need to be very discerning. We need to not hear and listen to everything. We need to test the Ruach, the spirits of these things. Through our king. And so this is a scripture that instructs us to do just that. To the Torah and to the witness. The Torah and the witness are both one and the same. They had the witness that was in the Ark of the Covenant. What was it? It was a Torah written on stone. Two stones, front and back. Read the account. Don't let Charlton Heston uh, 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 make you think it was just five on, on one side. Or ten on one side. It was five, five on the front, five on the back. It was written front to back. And they're called witnesses. Witnesses between father and man of the contract, the covenant, that was made at Mount Sinai. If they do not speak according to this word, what word according to the Torah, it is because they have no daybreak. They have no light. If we go to, go back again, the Yohanan, Yochanan, 1 John, or John 1, John Aleph, we read 1 through 5 or 1 through 6 that Yahuwah, excuse me, Yahusha, specifically, is the life of men, which is the light of men. He's that light, which was the life. Torah, Yahusha's relationship with Yahuwah, not a religion about him. Religion is a man-made construct to oppress and extort. To oppress and extort money, time, effort, so forth and so on. That's to build that kingdom. Okay, so what, what what are we doing here? Why are we here? And Father was talking with me, and he was saying, let my people know this is for a reason, for a purpose. We're not in religion. We're not in religion. We're not in religion. This is not something we do just because we're good people, and it makes us feel good, and, and, and you know, we do this thing, and then we continue in our life. There is a reason. You know, a lot of those in the circus I've asked, uh, uh, what are we going to do, be doing in the Shamayim over the years? They uh, uh, And they actually really don't know, even though it's in Scripture. It's there. But see, the teachers, the false teachers, stir them away, uh, give different definitions, uh, uh, give different reasonings, or just omit certain things. And, and it's there. So why are we doing this? What is this for in part? Let's read. De Debraim, Deuteronomy. Four, chapter 4, 5 through 9. See? When somebody says see, that means pay attention. Behold also is another one. You could, they're interchangeable. See, behold. Pay attention to this. I have taught you laws and right rulings as Yahuwah, my mighty one, commanded me. 
You know, sometimes I feel like these are my words. I really do, because he's commanded me to teach you guys these things. So here I am. And I'm not trying to say I'm Musa. I'm just saying here I am, a next generation of teachers and leaders doing the same thing. To do thus in the land which you go to possess. And you shall guard and do them. For this is your wisdom. This is your wisdom and your understanding before the eyes of the peoples who hear all these instructions. And they shall say, only a wise and understanding people is this great nation. Well, Pastor Derek, that's not true because you just even said yourself that uh, they fight, they fuss, that they, they think we're crazy. Well, yeah, at first. At first. They don't know what you're doing. They knew you for a while. You were this way, especially if his family grew up doing all this stuff. That father that was unpleasing the father, eating unclean things. And all of a sudden, you're not doing that, and they don't know you no more. Who are you? They thought they knew you. And sometimes it's very troubling for people when somebody shifts and changes so dramatically and becomes set apart. It's almost as if you're not part of the family anymore. Who are you? We do this as a family. And now you're doing something else, and we don't do that. Well, who's this group of people you're with now that you're calling family? Oh, this sounds like some cult thing. Oh boy, here we go, right? That's what they're saying. But give it time, as I said before, and they will speak these words as they watch you do this wisdom, and they're then going to say, wow, what a change they have made. And look how much better they are as a human being. And they're going to go, hmm, well, I would like to be better too. They're going to see the benefits. They're going to see the anointing. They're going to see the, the, the blessing on your life, that everything you touch prospers. That even when you go through things, how you handle it and how Father gets you through. We're doing a disservice when we don't do that for them and to them as we open our fat mouths, I'm going to say it that way, and, blah, 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 and we harass them. And you wonder why you're getting bit back. Oh, pastor, they, they don't listen. They, they, they're always fighting with me. Well, you can't fight unless you're fighting with them. Keep your mouth shut and just do it. Do the work. Do the work. And they will say these things. See, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what your experience is. Father's word is true. I don't trust your experience. I trust Father's word. His word says this is what they will say. If, if they're not saying it about you over time, then that means you're not doing his word right. That I trust. Father, you, you saying that Father's word is wrong? I don't trust that. Absolutely not. And will never. We're going to continue. For what great nation is there which has the mighty one so near to it? As Yahuwah, our mighty one, is to us wherever, whenever we call on him. And what great nation is there that has such laws and right rulings, righteous rulings, righteous right rulings like all this Torah, which I set before you this Yom? Only guard yourself and guard your life diligently with much effort. Guard your life, lest you forget the words. Your eyes have seen. At least they turn aside from your heart all the yomaim of your life. And you shall make them known to your children and your grandchildren. How do you make them known? Is it always by speaking? Behavior. Behavior. They'll see that you're different. They see, well, how come grandma, grandpa don't come over for the birthday? Why grandma and grandpa don't celebrate Christmas? Why gra grandpa don't cuss like all the rest of the relatives and adults do and some of the kids? When I say kids, I'm talking about what we call teenagers and such on down. Why do I get this? There's somebody who was a grandmother and uh, the grandchild said, I can talk to you. I feel right talking to you. I don't. You're my best friend. 
father heard dad wasn't too happy about that. But the father's allowing things to happen that are unrighteous. See, children know stuff. Ch children know who are good and who's not. They'll figure it out real quick. They'll figure it out real quick. No matter how much you hide it, they'll know. So if children don't like you, or they always, you know, outside of them being shy, but they never warm up to you unless, you know, there's a couple kids like that, but overall children don't really care. Yeah, you might. Animals don't come to you. They don't particularly care for you. There's a comedian, a country, western comedian, just go, there's your sign. <laughs> there's your sign. You might want to think about it. Instead of going, stupid dog, stupid kids. See, even that attitude tells you something about yourself. Okay, let's get to the cover. Yes, Sister Jennifer did a marvelous job at without her scriptures because I challenged her. I said, stop bringing your scriptures up there as a clutch. You know this. And she took me up on it. It was a strong suggestion. And she sits up here because she knows it's in her heart. But we're going to go over it again and see what the Ruach wants to expose. Uh, the covenant marriage contract, the Brith Shemot, we find it in Shemot, or Exodus 21 through 17, Ashad Hadabarim, the 10 words. Yahuwah's covenant, our wedding vows. Little translation. And the mighty one spoke all these words. It's not the law of Musa. They're trying to humanize it so they can discredit it. But if it's Yahuwah speaking it, then they got to obey, right? So it's the law of Moses. No, it's not. He was just, you know, when the speaker, when you hear voices come out the speaker and you hear a singer, you know, go, oh, the speaker sung so well. You say that person. Uh -huh sung so well, whoever that singer is, right? You, you may say the speaker sounded good and helped bring forth that voice that was singing. Has to be a certain type of vessel. Yeah, it, it'll sound different when the vessel isn't uh, 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 well put together, uh, corrupt, or anything like that. So, okay. We're going to continue. So it's not Musa. Musa was just bringing forth what Father was saying, the, the Creator. And he's going to continue here. I am Yahuwah, your mighty one, who brought you out of bondages. That's not the name of that place. It's not Egypt. It was, it was a description of what it was to them. All the so-called mighty ones in Scripture, those are not their names. Those are descriptions of them because they're not allowed to say their names. Scripture says don't call on their names. Don't invoke it. I am Yahuwah, your mighty one who brought you out of bondages, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other mighty one before my face. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything. What is an idol? I know something that you worship, something that you may give praise to, something that you may even give offering to. A lot of you don't realize you have idols in your life. A favorite singer, and you buying the records and they're rich off of you. Well, that's an idol. That's an idol. You should not bow down to them or worship them. For I, Yahuwah, you're a mighty one. I'm a jealous mighty one. Excuse me. <laughs> Punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. How do you show that you hate him? By not, by not obeying his instructions. But showing love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Generational curses are real. You know, uh, parents don't want to believe that their actions and behaviors will affect their children. They don't even want that responsibility. I've heard it too many times. That's not my fault. You know, a lot of times it is your fault. You know, there was a situation that came up. Uh, Daniela, if you're, if you're watching, I love you. Um, Brother Daniel's daughter uh, was upset because I had a picture of her brother, uh, Nano. And I showed it. And she said, where's the picture of me? I didn't let that go. I didn't go, oh, whatever. She's just a little girl. No, that hurt her. That bothered her. 
so I wanted to address them. When it was brought to my attention, I, you know, through Brother Daniel, I said, oh, I want to talk to your daughter ASAP. And we got to right there after he told me. And I said, sweetheart, you know, I, 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 I didn't have a picture of you. Remember, we didn't take any pictures of me and her by ourselves, you know, just me and her in the picture. I said, but you were in the picture with all of us with your dad, right? It was me, Nano, your father, and you. And I said, I did show that one, but you and me one-on-one, -on -one, you know, there is no picture. I said, but next time we'll get a picture and I'll show it. And she was okay. That You know, that little sweetheart of hers, that could have really did something to her growing up. That, that, that could have did something bad. We have to address these things. Could have, it could have caused something that could have become generational. So all adults need to be very careful with children and stop ignoring their feelings and go, oh, well, they're just kids. We all were kids. And all of us have stories of being hurt by adults. Do we not? And because of that hurt and pain that the adults inflicted willingly or knowingly or unknowingly, It caused us to do things. It caused us to feel a certain way. Unloved, unwanted. There was no way I was going to let that little girl have an inkling that she was unloved by me. No way. And so I took care of that quickly. And we, we should not ignore our children in that way. Brush it off. We will continue these generational curses. We may even start it in them. And that's just one mode and one way of doing it. Three, you shall not cast Nassau sin, the name of Yahuwah, your mighty one, to ruin Shua. Destruction, for Yahuwah will not hold anyone guiltless who casts his name to ruin. This is why I'm saying your behavior. Stop talking so much. I'm this, I'm that, I'm here now, I know the truth, blah, blah, blah. This means that and that means this. And your behavior is not, it hasn't changed. They still see your filthiness. They still see you in your addictions. They're, they're, they're present in your addictions. They're there while, while you're practicing your addiction. Or they see the aftermath of your addiction. And then when they speak to you about it, you're not even humble. You're fighting with them, and then now you won't talk to them about the truth of Yahuwah's word. Don't do that. Please keep your mouth shut. Please. And the reason why I say that, you think I'm talking about you as in shut up. I don't want you to get in trouble with Father because of this right here. You're going to be in trouble with Dad. No one, for Yahuwah will not hold anyone guiltless who casts his name to ruin. That's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. Four, remember the Shabbat day by keeping it Kodash or set apart six days. You shall labor and do all your work. Six days, please labor, not five, six. That is our instructions. Don't fight against it. It's okay. If you want to be mad at me, you're not really mad at me. These are not my instructions. I am just the one verbalizing what Father said to verbalize to his people. Six days. For the seven days of Shabbat, or Sabbath, to Yahuwah, your mighty one. On it, you should not do any work. Neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your animal, nor the alien within your gates. So if you have guests over, somebody who's permanent, maybe they're not in the walk, but guess what? They got to do the Shabbat if they're in your home, if they're on your property. For six days you have made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, and he rested on the seventh day. When we do the seventh day Shabbat, and there's more than that. It's the seven-day Shabbat, and it goes out 70 weeks. Uh, we, there's all these sevens. You've got, you got the millennium seven, a uh, thousand years of sevens, or 1,000 years, and each day adds up to up to the 7,000 year. So you got all these Shabbats. What we're doing is we're proclaiming creation is true. We're proclaiming Father as creator. We're proclaiming that he created Adam and Hawa, and that mankind came forth through that. If we don't do the Shabbat, we're not standing with Father. That is a sign. It's one of the seals of his people. The Shabbat. Why do you think Hasatan throughout, especially uh, right after, uh, right after relatively, Yahushua's death, burial, and resurrection, he was attacking the Shabbat. 
was a little easier without the temple there and the people in the dispersion kind of scattered. It was a little easier to implement that. He, he couldn't really get them to not do it while everything was together, while Yasharal was running in full and had their sovereignty as a nation. But once they were scattered and mixed up amongst the people and the calendar doesn't work out right for it and people, you know, the culture is, well, you know, we have fun. We do all this stuff. You're buying and selling. One of the biggest days of selling is what? The weekend. What we call, what we call the seventh and first day. All right, biggest days. Matter of fact, if you have a job, you work for somebody else, and you're in sales, almost mandatory you work those particular days, the weekend, because it's huge money making. Isn't that odd? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, saying the tax it. Why? Because it's it, it, it's establishing who the true creator is, and you get to join in that. Hallelujah! We get to be a part of that. Hallelujah. For in six days, Yahuwah made the heavens and the earth to see and all that sent them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, Yahuwah blessed the Shabbat day, and he set it apart. Five, honor your father and mother so that they may live long in the land. Yahuwah, your mighty one, is giving you. Six, you shall not murder. Two words, lo, rasak, no kill. Murder spirit in this world. You know, just talk about the Sacramento situation. Fight broke out. Guns came out. Pow, 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 pow. Six people are dead. People who weren't even involved in the scuffle are dead. Or in the disagreement are dead. What for? Why? Because, especially now, if you haven't noticed, I think you have, a life doesn't mean much. Take a life like the people who take a life. Oh, I could take a life. You know, I have friends in the military. And I know a couple who have had to. And I'm going to tell you. Um, it's a disturbing thing to take a life. I saw what they went through. And they're, and they're warriors. They're trained to do this. And messed up psychologically. Messed up. Um, nightmares, so forth and so on. Seeing the people's face that they killed over and over again. Yet, this generation is so easy to kill. It's something that's not natural to us. It really isn't. We're not designed to do that. That's not how Father designed us. It is a dysfunctional situation. We are malfunctioning when we do these types of things, or it's okay. Defend yourself, absolutely. See, you know what's interesting? When a, you know, a woman is being raped, the scriptures say kill him. I know it's a touchy issue right now. I get it. But we got, we, we got to deal with these things. What does scripture say to do? Yell and scream for help. It doesn't say that the woman is to kill that man. I, I'm sure she's supposed to yell and scream and defend herself. Get that man off of her. And get to running and get, get some help. Never does it say and kill him. Now, once the woman gets away and she reveals that this took place and they go before the judges and they see that it's an offense according to the Torah that he shall be stoned and killed and then that will take place there. It doesn't say kill him. I mean, this goes against everything I know here in America. This is a rough one. Uh-oh, what? It's not there. I can't... The instructions aren't there to do that. The instructions are that she must scream and yell. She must cry out. Those are the instructions. Not to carry a knife around. Not to blow his head off. Not to carry an axe. Not to get a stone and crush him in the head. It's just it's not there. So are we going to do things father's ways or not? That's what he sees. That's what he wants to see. Seven, you should not break wedlock. Two words, lo naaf, lo naaf. Here, here's another one. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. She or he is X, Y, and Z. I'm unhappy. Well, are you going to show lack of love for father? Okay, so let's go back. Let's go back. He 
He shows love to thousands of generations of those who love him and keep my commands. He shows love to them. He wants us to be obedient to his word. That's how you show love. So I'm going to go ahead and break wedlock, which is one of his commandments, that says, I don't love you, Yahuwah. I love myself more. Stepping on toes. Boy, I can hear this one. This is, a, this is Father's word. See, we got to put it together right. we got to have this understanding so that we can get the maximum blessings. Not only that, so that we can show them our maximum love for him the best we can. And that means denying self. Are we not living a self-sacrificing life? So when we're sacrificing, it's supposed to be a sac it's supposed to be something that's uncomfortable. It's something you're giving up. It's it, are you are you understanding? Being with father is not about being comfortable. Matter of fact, he informs us that that is the opposite while we're in this world and the way it is. To be set apart is not, it's a sacrifice. We, have to, we will sacrifice parties that we won't be going to, family and otherwise. For years where I worked, they tried to get me to go to the Christmas party. Then they changed the name. Or at the end of the year party. I said, no, it's still a Christmas party. We'll just have it before the end of the year. It could be New Year's, it's Christmas. Oh no, here comes one of the front desk girls. Oh, you coming to the Christmas party? I wouldn't go every day. They band it together to figure out a way how to get me there. Why? Why? And every year something disgusting happened. Something I'm glad I would hear. Something uh, horrible happened every year. Somebody was drunk and did this or did that. And I'm so glad that I wasn't part of that. I'm glad I was set apart. I didn't want to be a part of that. I wanted to obey. Was there amazing places to go eat? And all the food they talked about? Yeah. Free? They went to some expensive places. Nice. Nice places. And Is that worth me disobeying the one I love? See, uh, to bring it home, it'd be like a, a man who sees a, a, a beautiful woman, and maybe she's more beautiful than his wife. That's, that, that happens, right? It happens on the other side of the fence, too. Maybe there's a man better looking than your husband. Maybe you feel he's nicer. He listens. She listens. She cooks better. She does all this stuff. What are you going to do? Are you going to say, I'm missing out, so let me go ahead and be over here so I don't miss out? That's what we do with Father all the time. We compromise because we're missing out. I'm missing out. I really want to go to this, that, or the other. I want to participate with it. And then we compromise. And we hurt our Father's heart. Understand that. You're hurting your dad's heart, the one you say you love. It's written in scripture. His heart gets crushed. He gets hurt. When we don't obey and love him. He wants to be loved. He wants you to love him. What parent doesn't want their children to love them? A dysfunctional parent. Something wrong with them. But every parent wants love from their child. It's not that they're needy. It's not a weird thing. I've heard people say, oh, it's weird. It seems like he just needs love. Don't you? If you say no, you're lying. And thou shalt not bear false witness. Even if it's against yourself, you're lying. You want to be loved, but you only can get what you give. That's how this world works. You work hard, right? You obtain things. If you're lazy, you're going to die in poverty. So love, Father. He's your husband. He says, stay, stay. Pray for him to make a way. He'll make a way somehow. Either he'll re help rectify the situation. And who knows what he may allow things to continue or not. But let it be his decision. And his alone. Don't you go doing that. Eight. You shall not steal. Two words. Lo, 
Ganab, low ganab, no steel. Well, you know, I talked about that many times before. Paper clips, uh, using the printer at work and without permission. Taking too many, as Father dealt with me, with taking too many ketchups and hot sauces and napkins that were available for it, little plastic for you know, things of that nature. That was stealing. I said, don't do that. Take only what you need. Yes, sir. You should not give false testimony against your neighbor. Ten, you should not covet your neighbor's house. You should not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, anything that belongs to your neighbor. I don't know why. I, I All right, back to the uh, um, back to the divorcing thing. Um, you know, what if, what if it's physical harm involved? Separate. 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 The secret of Yahuwah is with those who fear him. And he makes his covenant known to them. Ten of Limbs 25.14 I am Yahuwah. Not anything else. <laughs> Yahash, Yeshaya, uh, Isaiah 42.8 And here we are. Yeshaya 52.6 My people shall know my name. They shall know his name. So you got these groups who are saying other things, other names. They don't know him. They don't know him. He doesn't know them in that way, in that way. Kowilith, uh, Ecclesiastes 12, uh, 13 through 14, chapter 12, 13 through 14. This is Slomo or Solomon as we uh, have been taught and believed to be so. And by his writing and how he wrote, it seems to be accurate. And let's see what he had to say from his position of being the richest man on the planet, the wisest man on the planet at that time as well. And he searched out how life was or, or what life was about from his perspective. And this is the conclusion he comes at the last chapter of his book. Let us hear the conclusion of the entire matter. Fear the mighty one and guard his commands. This is the conclusion. Fear the mighty one and guard his commands. Are you guarding his commands? Are you guarding your own heart? Oh, I feel like, well, I want to. I don't want to miss out. It'll be fun. Or are you going to guard his commands? What did it say about those who guard his commands? Those are the ones who love him. We go back, right back to Shemot, right? Chapter 20. And what does he do with those who love him? He blesses them and all their generations, their children. And their children's children. See how these, these scriptures connect. For this applies to all mankind, not just what the modern day would say, the Jews. It's good if you're a Jew. Well, if it's good for any group of people, maybe it's good for some other group of people. Good is good. Good is good, right? I know, there's some smart mouths out there. Well, not really, not all the time. Well, you know, if somebody, this could be good for somebody there, and this other person allergic to it. Okay, all right. You go ahead and continue with that rebellious way of thinking and talking. and Yes, that is true, but you know what I'm saying and you know what I mean. And that's just rebelliousness. Lack of submission, lack of humility. And it says that the meek shall inherit the earth. He's called us to be a humble people. You cannot be in the kingdom if you're scoffing like that. You can't be. For the mighty one shall bring every work into right ruling. Including all that is hidden. Some of y'all hiding some stuff. If you're hiding it just in your heart. You know, your friend, the Mishpah Khan, you're, yeah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In your heart, something else is going on. Do that if you want. You know, we're, we're, I am not somebody you're going to be standing in front of on Judgment Day. It's not me. I'm going to be in line with you. We we. we uh oh, there you go. It's your turn. Okay, mine's is coming up next. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about the other human beings. Get out of here with that. Please stop. Father, you know, we we don't really believe he's real. We don't believe he's what he's watching right now. You can't go to the bathroom and he don't see you. You can't be in the shower and he don't see you. He knows the whispers around the corner that nobody else is hearing, but he no hears it. No place is dark to him. You can't hide. There's no one to run to, nowhere to hide. But do we really understand that? We think we're getting away with stuff all the time. If we really understood that, we wouldn't do 
nearly as much if we knew that eyes were on us right now. Eyes are on you right now. Matter of fact, it's just not Yahuwah. The demonic is sitting there watching you. As well, those who have continued to align themselves, who are our spiritual brothers, are sitting there watching you as well. Don't be comfortable that nobody sees you. A spiritual being is watching. A spiritual being is watching. And Father is reading your heart. He Not only does he read your heart, he goes all the way down to the kidneys. He goes all the way down to the kidneys. That's how deep he can get. He knows your intentions, why you're doing it, how come you, and what you're not doing and what you want to do that's against him and is being written in a book. What does your book read about you? Compromiser, compromiser, f fake showing off in front of uh, 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 the Mishpacha, but doesn't love me. Wants to do what they want to do, how they want to do it. When, when, when given uh, uh, words of correction, doesn't heed to it. In any form that I've sent it, directly through my spirit or through my servants. What does your book say about you? You should tremble at that thought. You should tremble at that thought because you know. You know. For the mighty well shall bring every work into right rule, including all that is hidden, whether good or whether evil. Are we Christians? Are we Messianic or Nazarim? Let's say what Yahushua told us. Yohan, uh, Yohanan, Yohanan, John 15, 1 through 2, then we go to 5 through 8. I am the true vine. You can find that in Strong's 5341, Nassar. And, and, and the vine is a uh, symbolistic, metaphoric way of describing that. And my father is the gardener. So we know who the gardener is. He's the vine. Father planted. If you read it in Psalms, um, right now it loses me exactly where it's at, that he planted a vine and how it took over the hill. So he's the gardener. Yahuwah, the father, is the gardener. Yahusha is that vine. And we are the branches, every branch, Nazarene in me. That bears no fruit, he takes away. As I, as most of you know, I'm a gardener. When I see certain things not bearing fruit, I snip, snip, snip. So the vines, the vines, the offshoots that are, can even produce better and more. So that energy isn't going over here where it's unproductive. Every branch, not Zerim, in me that bears no fruit, he takes away. And every branch, not Zerim, that bears fruit, he prunes. Why? So that it bears more fruit. Who's the vine? Yahushua says, I'm the vine. Who are the branches? He says, you are the branches, not Zerim. He who stays in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. What fruit are you bearing? Are you bearing much fruit? Are you bearing good fruit? Are you truly in him? You'll be bearing good fruit. And everybody around you will know that. Because without me, you are, you are able to do not. If anyone does not stay in me, he is thrown away as a branch, as a Nazarene. He's talking about his people. Those branches that are shooting out of him, that are not staying in him, they can't bear fruit, they're, they're, they're dried up and looking sickly, sucking up energy that others could be having. He cuts them off. And he throws them away as a branch, a Nazarene, and dries up. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you stay in me, and my words stay in you, you shall ask whatever you desire, and it shall be done for you. In this, my father is esteemed, and you, that you bear much fruit, and you shall be my taught ones. Why should we be his taught ones? Because we're bearing fruit. That's the proof that we're his taught ones. See, we can say all we want. Oh, he's our, he's our deliverer. He's our savior. He's our master. I follow him. Where's the fruit of that? Where's the fruit of that? Where's the evidence? See, the evidence isn't just showing off to the Mishpacha, the family. The evidence is in the dark. The evidence 
is what father is reading. He, he'll see it. And he'll go, okay, all right, with me. Oh, no, not really. No, not at all. Here we are again. Strong's uh, 5341. Nazarim, or Nazar, to watch, to keep, to guard. It's a verb, it's an action. Something we're supposed to be doing. A lot of verbs in the Hebrew. They're very verb-driven uh, uh, society as far as expressions. You know, love is a uh, something you do, not what you say. You can say it, but the proof is in what you do. And what you don't do. Secular history. We got proof coming. So we got Oedipus, who's a first century circus uh, uh, father. He is not one of ours. If we were to call anybody like that, it would be the emissaries, the twelve. And the, you know, not, not the one that hung himself. And so here is what he wrote down. The fourth century uh, circus father, Oedipus, gave a detailed description of this. But the sectarians did not call themselves Christians, but Nazarenes. He, again, not being a really versed in Hebrew. Um, they assumed that where he was from sounds like Nazarene, Nazarene. They, similar but not the same. However, they are simply complete Jews. That word would not be there that came around the 15th century. So be careful when you read ancient texts and what they want to continue to manipulate your mind into believing. Because that J word is only a, a, a little over 500 years old. So it would have been Yahudim, it would have been Hebrews, a Brit people, it would have been something else. But they stuck this here to continue to brainwash us and mislead us. They use not only the New Testament, but also the Old Testament, as well as the Abrites do, the Hebrews. They have no different, Abarit, they have no different ideas, but confess everything. Exactly as the law proclaims it, and in an Abarit fashion. Except for their belief in Mashiach. If you please, for they acknowledge both the resurrection of the dead and the divine creation of all things and declare that the mighty one is one and that his son is the J-man, the Messiah. Today, the sect of Nazareans is found in uh, Berea near Co Assyria in the Decapolis near Pela and the Mashantis at the place called Kokab and Kokab in Hebrew. For that is the place of origin, since all the disciples had settled in Pela after they left Jerusalem. Messiah told them to abandon Jerusalem and uh, draw and withdraw from uh, from it because of its coming siege, and they settled in Perea for this reason. And as I said, spent their lives there. That was where the Nazarene sect began. Well, we knew it began before that. But this is his take on it. And uh, uh, they're not even listening to their own people. This thing called Christianity is something else. It's a replacement. It is the anti-Mashiach system is replaced. Not just against, replaced. Scriptural proof. Let's go into Acts uh, 24, 1 through 5. And after five days, the high priest Hananiah came down with the elders and certain speaker Tertullius, and they brought charges against Saul uh, before the governor. And when he was called upon, Tertullius began to accuse him, saying, Having obtained great peace through you and reforms being brought to this nation by your forethought, we accept it always in all places, most excellent Felix, with all thanks, but in order not to hinder you any further. I beg you to hear us briefly in your gentleness. For having found this man a plague who stir up dissension among all the Yahudim throughout the world. See, there's something here right here, by the way. There's a hidden truth here. Who are Gentiles that Saul went to go see? I said this last week. I had a friend who was Vietnamese. He called his children bananas. I said, why do you call them bananas? He said, they're yellow on the outside, white on the inside. He meant they've been American. I, and you know terms. Each ethnic group has certain terms when uh, 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 their children are raised in a different culture, no longer part of the culture or mindset that they originally come from. So this isn't nothing new. I caught the Ruach had me catch this. 
when uh, a scripture in Acts said, and Saul went to, the, uh, went to the synagogue on the Sabbath and spoke to the Gentiles and the Greeks. I said, wait a minute, synagogue spoke to Gentiles and the Greeks? Aren't Greeks Gentiles? And he spoke to Gentiles at the synagogue? Well, I thought there were Hebrew people that were there. So, of course, I started researching and looking and find out that when they called, they, they, it was a derogatory term of those who were of DNA ancestry who were in the dispersion that no longer were culturally Abrit people, Abrit people. They were acting like the Gentiles, so they called them Gentiles. This is why Saul had to get on Kepha for separating himself that way when what? When those from Jerusalem came up and because of that kind of, for lack of a better word, racism, in a sense, because they felt they were disgustingly dirty, they ate things, they did things, they didn't want to be around them, the Gentiles. Um, he separated himself. But so, you, you know, when you have one of your own behaving in such a way, it's even worse. So he separated himself and, and, and Saul called him out on that. So these were DNA Abarit people, Hebrew people who were in the dispersion. Here it is. He didn't say he goes out in all the world and messing with those who are not of us. They wouldn't even care if that was the case. They cared and were upset because he was disturbing, bringing that good news to fellow Abarit Hebrew people. And a ringleader of the set called the Nazarenes was Nazarim. Okay, let's see what Saul says. Uh, chapter 24 of the same book of Acts 10, and then 14 through 16. And when the governor had motioned to him to speak, Saul answered, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge of this nation, I gladly defend myself, and this I confess to you, that according to the way, that's what we're in, we're in the way, the way of life, which they call a sect, that's okay, we are a sect. By definition, many things are a sect. Boy Scouts are a sect. Girl Scouts are a sect. Every religious organization out there is a sect. Don't worry about that. That's not a bad terminology. It's just a designation. We're not part of the occult. We are a cult. Sect and cult are synonymous. We're not of the occult. That's, and that's what a lot of people try to say. That's what they're really trying to say, but they don't know their words. Back to Saul. So I worship the mighty one of my fathers, believing all. He didn't believe that it was done away with. Where did it come that the Torah was done away with? That's something because he believed it all. Believing all that has been written in the Torah and in the prophets, having an expectation in the Mighty One, which they themselves also wait for, that there is to be a resurrection of the dead, both of the righteous and the unrighteous. And in this I exercise myself to have a clear conscience towards Yahuwah and men always. So what do we learn here? We learn the following. First, the Nazarene, like Paul, Keep the whole word of the mighty one, Yahuwah. They did not change the instructions of Yah, nor believe that the death, burial, and resurrection of Yahusha did. Except for the priesthood and atonement, uh, and atonement of sin component, read Abarim, the book of Hebrews. Two, the Nazarene professed to believe and follow our Messiah, Yahusha, and keep Torah. Three, the emissaries and Saul, who the Christians call Paul, were watchmen. That's our guardians of the way and of its foundation, the Torah, the instructions of high of life. Take a moment and reflect on the significance of this. This is very significant. The Catholic Circus Fathers made an admitted intentional departure from the way practiced by those in the Renewed Testament. This is something else. It's not of scripture. They took the book, gave different doctrines and theologies, and now a bunch of people are being misled by this. The great falling away, we're waiting for it. It has already started. Is We have just got here in it. Saul said the anti-Mashiach is coming, yet he's already here. It's already started. Saul was called the leader of the Nazarene, not Christianity. This means that not only did not only Saul kept and practiced the Torah, but all who followed Saul and was uh, discipled by Saul also studied the Torah. 
Yam Ha Bikarim. First fruits. I'm we'll getting to that. Um, so we're going to do a Hebrew word study real quick. Shemot Exodus 23 19. Bring the first of the first fruits. There's something new that I just learned. The Ruach gave the first of the first fruits of your land into the house of Yahuwah, your mighty one. Do not cook a young goat in his mother's milk. We're not really going to focus on that last part. We're focusing on the first part. The first of the first fruits. Fruit in a breed is para, which has the idea of offspring uh, or results, complete, uh, completements, accomplishments, excuse me. Hence, we walk, hence, we talk of the fruit or accomplishments of our labor. However, when scripture speaks of the, of the first fruits, it is using a different word. That word, as used in Shemot, Exodus 29, 19, is bukar, bukar. This, or we say in modern Hebrew, bukar. This has the idea of first to be, of first to be early. In modern Hebrew, you say, Bokar told, or good morning. Originally, the Bokar represented agricultural produce. The offering of the first fruits was not only practiced by the Abrit, but the Greeks and the Romans as well. This presented a real problem for the first century Abrit. For the Roman government demanded their first fruits, as did the Torah. Hence the question put to Yahusha by the Pharisees, should one pay taxes? Let's go to Man Yahu 22, 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to trap him in his words. And they sent to him their taught ones with the Herodians. The Herodians were a sect of Hellenistic, Abarit, who held political power. So they brought in these politicians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of the Mighty One in truth. And it does not, and it does not concern you about anyone, for you are not partial to any man. Then said, then say to us, then say to us, what do you think? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Remember, they're trying to trap him, figuring out how they can jack him, right? But knowing their dysfunctionalness, Yahushua said, Why do you try me, you hypocrites? Show me a coin of the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then give Caesar what is Caesar's. And to Yahuwah, what is Yahuwah's? And having heard, they marveled and left him and went away. So they thought they had got him. We got him on this one. Boy, if he say don't pay taxes to Caesar, mm -mm -mm. we know he's about the Torah. He's going to say, give it to the temple. That's what he thought. That's what they thought. They were going to get him. This is why sometimes we got to slow down. People ask us questions. Pray and let Father lead your mouth, not you. This was a form of taxation where the citizens brought the first of the produce to the temple where it was sold and the proceeds used to pay wages as well as other expenses. So too, Shemot 23 is referring to the tithe to support the temple. So why use the word Borkar and not the para? The passage could have said the resh or rosh of the para are the first of the fruits. But instead it says the Rosh, Ruush, of the Bukar, the first of the first fruit. This is very specific. I'm going to sound like a tongue twister. It was a picture of Mashiach as the first of the first fruits of the harvest. Or we could throw in the resurrection. Although not happening coincidentally, 
the way of offering and the resurrection of Yahushua was linked together prophetically by the emissary Saul. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 22-28. For all have died at Adam, so all, so also all shall be made alive in Messiah, and each in his own order. Messiah the first fruits, or the first of the first fruits, and then those who are of Messiah at his coming. There's the order. The first of the first fruits, Yahusha, and then the first fruits, us. Then the end. And that's it. Okay. Then the end, when he delivers up the rain to Yahuwah the Father. When he has brought to now all rule and all authority and power. See, Yahusha's job is to get everything and get it back to functional, then he hands it back to the Father. He will not be reigning eternally. All we know of is a thousand years of reigning. But don't be don't don't be upset about that or weird out. Who is Yahusha? He's Yahuwah, a part of him. So he's turning us back to the bigger part of him. That's all. For he has to reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be brought to not his death. For he has put all under his feet. But when he says all are put under him, it is clear that he who put all under him is expected. And when all are made subject to him, then the Son himself shall also be subject to him who put all under him. So who put all under him? We're talking about Yahuwah. There's another little riddle type way of saying it. In order that Yahuwah be all in all. Here the emissary Saul clearly links the first fruit offering with the resurrection of Yahusha our Mashiach. Yahusha's resurrection was like a wave offering represented before Yahuwah as the first of the first fruits of the harvest to come. So now we're going to get into the meat. We're going to do first fruits. Uh, uh, and understand that, uh, message, uh, so messenger of the name, we'll be listening to him. He's going to be very detailed as we've been listening to him for the last uh, three or four weeks. Um, get your pen and paper out. Get your recording. Uh, watch this again. It's going to be in depth. You're not going to get it all every time. I, I've been listening to this for a long time now. And every time I get something new out of it, uh, didn't hear that part because at my maturity level or wherever the Ruach wanted to give to me was only for that particular time. So I love going over this. And please have, be, be habitual about these things. Go over these teachings over and over again. Not just this one, all of the teachings in this ministry. Over and over again, I'm sure you've missed something. I'm sure that Father is going to bring out something else um, as you were working on this, then, it, then this is going to come out. So uh, spend your time in His Word. Spend your time eating. You, you know, you like to eat physically. Spend your time feasting on His Word and, and healing your soul. That's the only thing that can nourish your soul. Um, I want to make a disclaimer right now. We, as a, a Light Away Ministries International, do not adhere to everything that He believes in. As he may not us as well. So uh, that's one thing I just want to give as a disclaimer. And uh, enjoy and eat. Shalom, 
and welcome to the Feast of Yahuwah series. In this lesson, we are going to look at Rashid Katsir, that is the first of the harvest, which you have probably heard called Habikurim, which is the first fruits, because this is the day when the first fruits of Hasora, which is the barley, is offered up by the Kohen Haggadah. It is offered up in the tender green head, as it is usually translated in Wayikra, Leviticus chapter 2. But when we look at that word as we already have, we see that Yahuwah names this Abib, which he has also named the very first month of Hashanah, the year. So Abib is a very specific moment in time, because we know that it, the word literally means the tender green head. But Yahuwah's word says that the tender green heads must be parched with fire. And then they are to be weighed out as an omer by the Kohen Haggadah, the high priest. And then he is to lift up the offering, the Bikor offering, the first fruits offering before Yahuwah Elohim. And it is to be done each and every year forever as the word of Yahuwah prescribes. And this is a very special prophetic feast day, though many consider it a minor festival because Yahuwah's word does not say that it is a Shabbat or a day in which no work should be done or anything like that, but rather the entirety of the festivities hinge upon the revelation of the Kohen Haggadah, the high priest, and his offering before Yahuwah Elohim. So Rashid Katsir is the first harvest that takes place each and every year, and it happens in Chodesh Ha'abib. Yahuwah's word in Deborim 16 says that we are to shamar at Chodesh Ha'abib. Shamar literally means to look for and observe and narrowly search for. Et is usually untranslated. However, it has a very deep meaning, as we already know, because Yahuwah Elohim has given us His Word. And the Word, the Debar, is also the Aleph and the Ta, the first and the last. The very first Hebrew letter is Aleph, and the very last Hebrew letter is Ta, and that represents the idea of Debar, of Word, because the Aleph and Ta are the possibilities for all words. And the actual word for letter in the Hebrew or the Abrit, the Ivrit, as some say, is et or ot. Ot is also spelled aleph and ta. So therefore, you have the concept again of word, but also the word ot and et and oth can all mean a sign and a signal. So we are to look for the sign. Remember in the book of Genesis, Bereshith, chapter 1, Yahuwah Elohim says that he made the lights to be for the otot, for the signs. And they are to be for the appointed times and for days and for years. So Yahuwah Elohim marks time and begins time with signs, and those signs are lights. So when he says Shamar et, we know that we're looking for light. And then it says Shamar et Hodesh, and we know that word Hodesh literally means renewal. It is interchangeable and is often interchangeable through the Torah and the prophets with the word Yerak. And Yerak is the literal word, which means moon. However, there are applications in which it has been translated also month, just as the word Hodesh is often translated new moon and sometimes month. They are interchangeable concepts together, so we know that we're looking for the light of the moon and that word Hodesh means the renewing and the rebuilding, so we know we're looking for the very first piece of light that can be seen when the moon begins to rebuild. And that moment happens when we can see the faint sliver, the faint first point of the light of the Yerak, of the moon. 
in the western sky when the sun sets, because we know that a day begins in the evening and it ends in the evening. Because there was evening and then there was morning the first day, and evening and morning the second day, and on and on and on. And Yahuwah Elohim put this into motion. So therefore, it is fitting that the sign appears in the western sky when the sun sets and the evening has come to be. So that we know that this is the new moon day. It has begun. There's the sign. But we also learn that that word Hodesh is also very, very interesting because the word literally describes polishing a sickle used for harvesting grain. And when we look for the sign, when we shamar, observe, and look for diligently that sign in the Shamayim, and we see, we see the picture of the first point of light in the moon phase, when the moon begins to rebuild itself, that it looks to be a sickle in the Shamayim, in the heavens. We see Yahuwah Elohim has put this in the Shamayim for us to see. But the actual uh, revelation is we are to shamar at Hodesh, look for the sign of the Hodesh that takes place in Ha'abib. Shamar et Hodesh Ha'abib. Ha'abib means the Abib. When the barley is in a stage of development that Yahuwah Elohim names Abib, which means tender green heads. So when we see the sickle ready for the harvest, and we can look and we see that there are tender green heads that are appropriately sized and solidified inwardly, and they can be parched with fire. Then we know that the time has come, the beginning of the year is upon us, and we've already discovered all this information already in the study on the Rosh Hashanah, the head or the beginning point of the year, and also in the section on Rosh Hodesh, which is the renewal of the moon or the new moon or month. So all this information has been covered very thoroughly. But it is important to understand the agricultural aspect of Yahuwah's living calendar. Yahuwah has given us the opportunity to observe and look for and see the signs and know the times. And he, he's placed all this right before us. So there's the sign in the Shomayim, there's the sign on the earth, because Yahuwah Elohim wants the first fruits. He wants the Bikurim. So the very first harvest of the year, of the Shana, is Rashid Katsir. It is the offering of barley the parched abib barley that is weighed out again by an omer and lifted up as an ascending offering, a raising offering, what has been called a wave sheath. Ha omer, he lifts it up in the measurement of an omer before Yahuwah Elohim and nobody can eat of the harvest of their barley until Yahuwah Elohim gets his first fruits. No sickle can touch the grain until Yahuwah Elohim receives of his first fruits. That's how important the idea and concept of the Bikurim of the first fruits literally is. And remember, Yahuwah does not just ask of the first fruits of the harvest, but he asks for the Bikurim. Remember that word. Bikurim can also mean the firstborn. So he also asked for the firstborn, Habikor, the firstborn of man and beast. And we see that Yahuwah Elohim is very enthusiastic about this concept, saying that it is a sign upon our right hand and in our forehead even. The idea of giving him the first and the best, trusting him with what comes first so that he knows he can trust us with what comes latter. And all this is very prophetic. All this is very important. And we need to understand Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest. Because the first of the harvest is considered a minor festival. And that is because 
The Torah does not say that it is a Shabbat, that no work should be done on Rashid Katsir. But all of the responsibility hinges on the Kohen, on the high priest. It is his responsibility to appear before Yehulahim. It is his responsibility to parch the abid barley with the fire. It is his responsibility to lift up the offering. And again, it is so prophetic. It echoes through time and space the amazing revelation of the first harvest. And there are three harvests that take place each and every year. Again, the barley harvest, the Rashid Katsir, that is the first harvest. But there is another harvest, the second harvest, which is directly related to the first harvest because it is connected by a chain of seven completed Shabbatot, seven completed Sabbaths. Yahuwah has told us that from this moment that the offering is given, That we are to number for ourselves seven completed Shabbatot. And the morrow after must give us 50. That is the pattern. We're going to read about it in just a moment. And this time is called Shabbat because it literally means weeks. Pointing to the fact that these seven completed Sabbaths are seven completed weeks. And we're counting the weeks And that the morrow after, again, is that time period. And that time period is the day when the offering of the wheat is given in the form of two leavened loaves that are lifted up again, just as the parched barley heads are lifted up 50 days prior. And again, they are connected together with the seven completed Sabbaths and the morrow after giving us the 50th day. A picture of the fact that every seven years there would be a Sabbath year. And when you had seven completed Sabbath years, seven times seven 49 years, the morrow after, the year after, literally, would be the Yobel, would be what is called the Jubilee, when the debts are released. And so it was a time of great rejoicing. So Shavuot is also a time of great rejoicing because it is a Bikor offering. But this time it is not the Bikor offering, the first fruits offering of barley, it is the first fruits offering of wheat. And then in the seventh Hodesh, the seventh moon cycle, Yahuwah has told us to observe a feast that is called Sukkot. And Sukkot literally means booths or tabernacles. So many have heard of the Feast of Tabernacles. But it is also a Bikur offering that is associated with this. It is a first fruits festival. It is also, all of these are directly tied to the three pilgrimage feasts as well. But Sukkot, during the time of the tabernacles, the people are to to bring of the first fruits of those things which ripen during that time of the year, such as the figs and the pomegranates and the olives and the grapes and the dates and all these various things that produce, again, during this particular time in the land of Yashorel, in Eretz Yashorel. And the reason that this is important is because Yahuwah Elohim has said during this time that the Bikurim, the firstborn of Yashorel, are to bring, those firstborn males, are to to bring of the firstfruits. And they're there to offer up offerings to Yahuwah Elohim and enjoy the Hagim, the festivals, and the Moedim, the feast days. So again, it is important to understand that Rashid Katsir, the first offering of the barley, though it is seen as a minor festival, it is huge in the fact that the entire idea of the beginning of the year is named Abib, Chodesh Ha'abib, the moon cycle of Abib, because of this offering, because of the offering of the Abib barley. All right, now let's go to Waikra, Leviticus. Chapter 23, which is the base text for this entire series. We have already read through verses 1 through 8, 
in great detail. But now we will pick up in verse 9. It says, And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Yashorel. And you shall say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, and you shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits. You will bring an omer, literally is that word sheaf. It is literally a measurement of the barley, an omer measurement. You shall bring an omer of the first fruits of your harvest, of Rashid Katsir, to the Kohen, to the priest, and he shall lift up the omer, or literally it is translated wave the sheaf. But again, it is lifted up in a specific fashion before Yahuwah Elohim as an ascending offering, a lifting up offering. And he shall lift up the Omer before Yahuwah for your acceptance on the morrow after the Shabbat, the Kohen waves it. Now in the context, we know we were just reading about Passover and unleavened bread, which happened to transpire in this same Hodesh, in the same moon cycle. So we know when it says the morrow after the Sabbath, clearly we are talking about the fact that you will have a weekly Sabbath somewhere in the count of the 14th of Abib, which is when the lambs are sacrificed, and all the way through to the 21st of Abib, which is the last day of unleavened bread, which is an eight-day time frame. So at some point during this time frame, which is marked out by the Chodesh, because Yehu Elohim has said the 14th of the Chodesh is when the lambs are to be slain. So we know it is Mechodesh from the renewal. But the Shabbat is not regulated by the Chodesh. So therefore, during this eight-day time frame, on one of those days, you are going to have a Sabbath, a Shabbat. It is guaranteed. So therefore, the following day, which will be the first day of the week and the first day of the counting of the seven completed Sabbaths and the morrow after giving you Shavuot, which has been called Pentecost, a count of 50 from the Greek. If you, if you know all these things and you see this, you understand how important Rashid Katsir is because it basically gives you the entire count for Shavuot. It gives you the entire count for what has been called Pentecost. So, this is all relative. During the time, again, from the 14th, when the lambs are sacrificed, all the way through to the 21st day of unleavened bread, which is the very last day, a, a complete count of eight days total. During this time period, you are going to have a Sabbath, a weekly Sabbath, a one of the days. The next day, the following day, the first day of the week, during this time period, is going to be Rashid Katsir. It is going to be the time when the Kohen Haggadah lifts up the wave sheaf, when he lifts up that Omer offering of the first of the harvest, the first of the harvest of the Abib barley, that tender green head of the barley. So this is very imperative so that we understand when this observance took place because of the prophetic implications and because of the fact that Yahuwah Elohim has said that this is a moed, this is an appointed time. This was a time where all the people would gather and observe what was transpiring in the Beit HaMikdash, in the house of Yahuwah, where these things took place, where they were there anticipating the offerings that would transpire during that time period. So it happens on the morrow after the Sabbath, after the weekly Sabbath, because the word there is Shabbat, the morrow after the Shabbat, HaShabbat. The Kohen lifts it up, and on that day, when you wave the sheaf, you shall prepare a male lamb a year old, a perfect one. 
as a burnt offering to Yahuwah. So not only is there going to be a representation of an ascension of the first fruits or a picture of the firstborn of the barley, but there is going to be a sacrifice of blood that will be done for this offering as well. But not only will this take place, not only will there be a male lamb, a year old, a perfect one as a burnt offering to Yahuwah, but then there is also, it says, and it's a, and it's grain offering two tenths of an ifah, of fine flour mixed with oil and offering made by fire to Yahuwah, a sweet fragrance, and it's drink offering. So there's a drink offering, one-fourth of a hen of wine, and you do not eat bread or roasted grain or fresh grain. So you cannot eat of the grain of that harvest for that year until the same day that you have brought an offering to your Elohim. So you can't have of it until Yahuwah gets his first fruits. A law forever throughout your generations in all of your dwellings. So, what is very important to understand here, just to recap, is the fact that this, what is seen as a minor festival, not only is it the first day of the harvest, so it actually represents the idea of the entire agriculture for the entire land of Yashara, for every single citizen within the borders of Yahuwah Elohim's promised land. But also, this gives us the code and the idea behind the appointed times. Because the appointed times must be seasonal. Because Yahuwah Elohim has put great emphasis on these offerings. So Rashid Katsir, it is the first offering of the year. But we know it is directly connected by a chain of seven completed Sabbaths and that the morrow after would be the 50th day that's going to be Shavuot, which has been called Pentecost, when the wheat offering would be lifted up before Yahuwah Elohim. So again, these two are connected. So we see not only is, not only do we see an individual uh, importance on Rashid Katsir, but we see that upon it hinges another festival and that they are truly not uh, one uh, on its own. They are connected. They're not just, you know, it's not just this offering and this offering. They are connected by a chain of sevens. And then the third offering happens in the seventh month. So then we see again the number seven. So it all comes back. So if we go on to verse 15, and read a little bit more about Shavuot, we get the criteria for the observance of Shavuot in its proper time. It says in verse 15, And from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf or the Omer, again, talking about Rashid Katsir, remember? The morrow after the Sabbath. It says, with the, after the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering or the ascension offering, you shall count for yourselves seven completed Shabbatot, which are Sabbaths. It does not say seven completed Shabuot, which means weeks, but rather seven completed Sabbaths. That is so important to understand the exact moment of not only Shabuot, which is the Feast of Weeks called Pentecost in the Greek, but, and that means a count of 50, but also we see here that this gives us a formula to not only know when this offering would be, but also to know for certainty with a second and third witness for when Rashid Katsir, the first of the offering, the first fruits of the Abi Barley is as well. Because listen, it says, and the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf 
or the Omer of the wave offering, you shall count for yourselves seven completed Sabbaths, seven completed Shabbatot, until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. You count 50 days. Then you shall bring a new grain offering to Yahuwah. So according to the criteria laid out for not only Shavuot, which is the feast called Pentecost by the Greeks again, but it also tells us exactly when Rashid Katsir is because it tells us that on this day, at this day, when you offer up Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of the barley, you number for yourselves seven completed Sabbaths. And it says, after the next day, after the seventh completed Sabbath, it has to give you 50. So literally, there is a mathematical formula here, and it is very simple. Seven times seven. Seven times seven is 49. The morrow after gives you 50. The only way that you can make this work is that you have to begin the count on the first day of the week. If you start the count at any other point in the week, you will not be able to make this mathematical equation work because the Torah says the seven completed Sabbaths must give you the morrow after being 50. So 7 times 7, 49 plus 1 is 50. So both Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of the barley, lands on the first day of the week. But also, you see that the offering of the wheat, which happens on Shavuot, the 50th day, the day that, again, they call Pentecost, the count of 50. Here, it, again, happens on the first day of the week. So again, both are tied together. There's no other way to interpret this scripture. However, if you look at the modern Jewish calendar, the modern Hillel calendar, you will see that there is influence by the Pharisees to have changed the idea of the count to 50. And I must first point out some very important truths about the history of the Yehudim and of the history of the Pharisees and what have been called the Sadducees. You see, the Sadducees are not just a sect or a denomination of Judaism, as people try to call it. Of course, we know that these were people of the house of Yehuda which has been called Judah, but Yehuda means those who praise Yahuwah. And the Zadokim, which have been called Sadducees, were literally a lineage of people from the sons of Zadok. Yahuwah Elohim made a covenant and a promise to Zadok that his sons would serve before him. And the Sadducees, the Zadokim, did exactly what the Torah says in the Beit HaMikdash, in the house of Yehud, because they were in control of these offerings. And they did the first fruits of the harvest of the barley on the first day of the week that took place during the time period of Passover and unleavened bread. That's how they did it. And they numbered for themselves seven completed Sabbaths. And then the morrow after gave them 50. And on the first day of the week, they offered up the two loaves for Shavuot, for the Feast of Weeks. So the Zadokim were Kohanim, they were priests, and they were in charge of these offerings. But the Pharisees, however, were more of a sect. The word Pharisee actually is proshim in Hebrew, and it means the interpreters, and they came up with their own uh, ideas about the Torah and how to interpret the Torah. And years after the time period of Mashiach, when Yahushua walked the earth, 
it came to be that the Pharisees began to disagree with the Sadducees about this particular time, the time of Rashid Katsir and of Shavuot. But never did they disagree. Notice, if you read and research throughout the history of the Yahudim, even if you go into the oral traditions of the Pharisees, which is called the Talmud and the Mishnah, you will see clearly that the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees did not disagree on which day the Sabbath was, nor did they disagree that the Shabbat began in the evening, nor did they disagree about the sighting of the new moon or of the spotting of the barley and the taking that into consideration with the calendar of Yahuwah. You see that both groups did these things. They agreed about nearly every single point of Yahuwah Elohim's calendar. But there came to be a disagreement. And so now you find yourself in a time after this disagreement came to be and that this position has been pushed. And the interpretation of the Pharisees is this, that Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of the barley, has to take place on the 16th of Abib every single year because they note the wording of the morrow after HaShabbat. And they say that this is referring to the first day of unleavened bread, which is on the 15th. So naturally the next day is the 16th, the morrow after the Shabbat. Well, that is an interesting idea, but the problem with this is, there are several problems actually, Within the Torah, it is not called a Shabbat. So if you're going by a literal interpretation of the Torah and the prophets, never is the 15th of unleavened bread called a Shabbat. Because in certain circumstances, of course, there is food preparation that must be prepared because of the fact that you are eating Passover beginning the first day of unleavened bread, which begins in the evening. Again, the lambs are slain on the 14th. They are eaten in the evening, going into the 15th with bitter herbs and matzah because it is the first day of matzah or unleavened bread. So anyway, they say that this is because this word is uh, that this day, rather, the 15th of Abib should be considered a Sabbath because it says that no work should be done. And it is true that later it began to be called in the lingo a Shabbat Haggadah, a special Sabbath, because obviously it is a special, it's a high Sabbath. Gadah literally means great or large, a large Sabbath. So it was considered that in first century time period. We see that actually in the Brit Hadashah, in the Renewed Covenant. In the book of Yahukanan or John chapter 19, we see that. We see the fact that they said that Yahushua had to come off of the stake they had to take him down because of the chief day of the Sabbath, which was approaching, which they were considering to be the 15th of Aviv. So you do see that idea there. But the fact is that during that time period, the Zadokim were in charge. And the actual first fruits offering happened the morrow after the weekly Sabbath, not the 16th of Aviv. But how can we further prove that that is incorrect. Well, here you have to understand the fact that the 16th can actually land on any one day of the seven-day week. Again, remember, Sheba is seven, and that gives us the word Shabua, which is week. Okay, so we know that a seven-day pattern is a week. And it has nothing to do with the Chodesh. Never do we see that Yahuwah Elohim says that the Shabuah has anything to do with the Chodesh, nor does he say to count the Sabbath, Mechodesh, from the Chodesh, from the renewal of the moon. So we know that it is not related. So therefore, you could literally have the 16th falling on any day of the week. And so you have a very tough time fulfilling what the Torah says, because the Torah says you have to number for yourselves not seven completed weeks, like the Pharisees are saying, but rather seven completed Shabbatot, 
Sabbaths, seven completed weekly Sabbaths, must be completed. And the morrow after must give you 50. So if you are not getting seven times seven, giving you 49 days, and the morrow after giving you 50, and you have seven completed Sabbaths, then there is something wrong with what you're doing. Because again, the 16th of Abib, if you're going by the Pharisaic uh, tradition, if you're going to go by this, then the 16th of Abib could technically land on the third day of the week. So yeah, it is true. You could make seven completed weeks. You know, you could count seven days, seven times, and the morrow after could give you 50, but the Torah says seven completed Sabbaths, not just weeks, Sabbaths. So you have to be able to have this actual Sabbath as part of the count, as part of the pattern. Seven times seven is 49. The morrow after is 50. So I had to go into that a little bit to explain because there are many people who are new to this information and probably have no idea that that is the case. Nor they, you know, probably don't know much about the actual history as well because it can be a little confusion. There's a, uh, confusing. There is a lot of information out there, but this is where all this comes from. So we know that Pentecost, the Greeks called it the count of 50, literally Pentecost, which is Shavuot, which is weeks. Again, it has to fit the criteria, and that criteria is literally laid out by the first of the harvest of the barley, because it is the first day of that count, the first day of that seven times seven, that seven completed Sabbath count that gives us the 49 the morrow after being 50. So, so Rashid Katsir has so many things that hinge upon it. Not only does the idea of the year appear to begin because of the idea of the Abib, which must be offered on this day. But also now we see that it is, you know, again, directly tied into by a chain of sevens. And this chain of sevens teaches us exactly what a week is and that it has nothing to do with the moon because there's no way that you could make this work if you had to recount it or recycle it, as people say, who keep a false idea of the Sabbath and say that the moon has something to do with the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath. You see with Shavuot that it doesn't. It has, any, it has nothing to do with it. There's no way. It's mathematically impossible. If your count is not seven completed Sabbaths and the morrow after giving you 50, then it's simply just not what the Torah says. And if you can accept that, then we can move forward and you can teshuvah and return and repent and Continue to walk in Yahuwah's way. Okay. Uh, we should also be aware of the practices of the first century so that we understand better the idea of the offering and so that we can understand the prophetic insights of the offering. Because on the 14th of Abib, that first month of the year, on the 14th day of that moon cycle, you will have the day that the Passover lambs are sacrificed. Literally, we know that that takes place at 3 p.m. Roman time, or it is also called the ninth hour according to the sundial. So at this time, the lambs are sacrificed. But what many do not know is what happens directly after the last lamb is sacrificed. The Kohen Haggadol and an entire entourage of Kohanim go to the Mount of Olives. And there they bind standing shocks of barley. They do not reap of the barley, however, until the sun goes down on the weekly Sabbath. Because the morrow after, they're going to have to offer it up as an ascension offering to Yahuwah Elohim. So they bind these standing shocks of barley. And when the sun goes down on the weekly Sabbath, they gather and all the people of the land who are there for the pilgrimage feast of unleavened bread and Passover specifically, they behold this offering and they behold this special time when the Kohanim go out to reap of the harvest. 
And when the Kohanim go to reap the harvest, they cry out, has the sun set? And the crowd responds, can the sun has set? Yes, the sun has set. And then they say, shall we reap? And they reply, yes, you shall reap. And then they say, with the sickle, to get the permission of the crowd. And they confirm, yes, with the sickle, in this basket. And the crowd says, yes, in this basket, because the Kohanim have to offer up the first fruits in a basket before Yahuwah Elohim. And then when they reap of this harvest, the Kohanim go back from the Mount of Olives to the Beit HaMikdash, to the house of Yahuwah. And there they beat these standing shocks of barley that had been reaped. And they beat the grain loose from the heads. And we know that they prepare uh, the barley at this, this time. There's a lengthy process. Overnight they prepare it to be an offering made by fire the following day as a first fruits offering, as an ascension offering before Yahuwah Elohim. It's very important to understand the way that these things were done in the time of the first century and how they were played out so that we can better understand the life, death, and resurrection of the Mashiach, but also so that we can understand the principles laid out in the instructions, in the Torah. That is what the word Torah literally means. It doesn't just mean law. It means instructions, principles, things that we should live by. Also, we should look at an example from Joshua, Yahushua chapter 5, verse 11. And it says, And they ate of the stored grain of the land on the morrow after the Pesach. Now, some have said that this word should literally not be stored grain, but refer it could refer to fresh grain. So it creates a question about how the idea of the first fruits offering should be done and on which day. And if we read it in context, it says, and they ate of the stored grain of the land on the morrow after the Pesach unleavened bread, and roasted grain on the same day. But literally, it could be stored grain, so that could be a literal answer. But if we want to go even further and say that this is fresh grain that they're eating, and we're wondering, well, how could they be eating it the morrow after the Passover? Well, it's quite clear. Because Yahuwah Elohim has said, it must be the fact that the day of the Passover, which is the 14th, was a weekly Sabbath. And the morrow after would be the appropriate time to give the first of the harvest. Therefore, they could eat of the fresh grain as well. So it's not really a major problem. And we can even prove that further. We could go to uh, Numbers. We go to Numbers chapter 33, verse 33, just to explain a little further, give you an example. It says, so they departed from Ramses in the first new moon on the 15th day of the first new moon on the morrow of the Pesach. So here we see that the day that was called the Passover is the Pesach. It's referring to the sacrifice of the Passover that happens on the 14th of Abib. So therefore, when it says it was the morrow after the Pesach, and it says right in the text it was the 15th day of the new moon, then therefore we know that this is the case, that Passover or Pesach is the 14th day. It's not talking about when the actual uh, meal is consumed beginning on the 15th. So here, this is not uh, proof for the rabbinical 16th of the uh, first month to be the first fruits offering of the barley, the Abib barley. But rather we know for certainty that this in fact is not proof because there are optional ways to understand what is happening here because of the fact of what the scriptures tell us are the right the criteria for the first fruits offering and when it must take place on the morrow after the weekly Sabbath. So, 
Let's go over to Proverbs or Mishli chapter 3 verse 9. In the Proverbs, it says, Esteem Yahuwah with your goods. That's talking about your produce, your tobin. And with the first fruits, with your bikurim. All of your of all of your increase, then your storehouses shall be filled with plenty, and your vats overflow with new wine. So if you want your vats to overflow with new wine, if you want to have plenty, then you must give to Yahuwah Elohim your first fruits, your bikurim. That's the importance that we're talking about here with this festival. This is not just something minor. This is major. Remember, when the Kohen Haggadah lifts up this offering, Yahuwah said in Wayikara Leviticus 23, where we just read that he does it for our acceptance. We know that Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is a day that is considered a day when the books are opened and that there is atonement made and forgiveness of sins and remissions of sins and there is acceptance. But many do not realize the fact that the very first concept in the year for this happens in Chodesh HaAbib, in the month of the Abib. Because when the wave sheaf, or literally the Omer, which is lifted, the ascending offering, is literally a picture of this fact. We have to understand that Rashid Katsir, the first fruits offering of the barley, it has so many implications throughout the scriptures. It is not just, uh, again, it's just some minor day. It hinges on the fact that it is a picture of the atonement which would take place, a picture of remission of sins. It is a time of acceptance when the Kohen comes before Yahuwah Elohim in Kodesh garments as a set-apart man, one who is Kodesh and one who bears the name of Yahuwah upon his head and he lifts up this offering. It is done for your acceptance. It is done as a righteous offering. And so therefore, we are to esteem Yahuwah Elohim with our first fruits. And if we do so, then we will have plenty. Our vats will overflow. In Waikra, Leviticus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, No grain offering which you bring to Yahuwah is made with leaven. For you do not burn any leaven or any honey in an offering to Yahuwah made by fire. Bring them to Yahuwah as an offering of the Bikurim, of the first fruits, but they are not burned on the altar for a sweet fragrance. And season with salt every offering of your grain offering, and do not allow the salt of the covenant of your Elohim to be lacking from your grain offering. With all of your offerings you bring salt. And if you bring a grain offering of your bikurim, of your first fruits, to Yahuwah, bring for the grain offering of your bikurim, of your first fruits, a bib. That's what it says in the Hebrew. But in the English, it says of the green heads. But remember, we're talking about the fact that Yahuwah Elohim called the first moon cycle a bib. He named it after this agricultural moment in time. He named it after this first fruits offering. So this first fruits offering is of the utmost importance. It is done to commemorate the beginning of the year. The fact that Yahuwah Elohim has given us a new year, a new beginning. It says, and if you bring a grain offering of your first fruits to Yahuwah, bring for the grain offering of your first fruits, Habib, of green heads of grain, roasted on the fire. So the barley must be roasted on the fire. Again, that is the requirement for the Habib. It cannot be premature Habib because it will not be presentable to Yahuwah Elohim. If you try to parch it with fire, it's not going to work. It'll be too tender. It is not solidified on the inside. It cannot be used. But it must be crushed grain. And it says that the green heads, again, must be roasted on the fire, crushed heads of new grain, and you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is a grain offering. So 
Not only is it a grain offering, but we see frankincense is laid upon it. Why? Because frankincense is a part of the sweet savor, the smell offering, the offering that brings soothing calmness, that gives uh, esteem to Yahuwah, the incense. And remember, our prayers are a picture of incense. Our tefillah rise up before Yahuwah as incense. But here is talking about the grain offering. So there is incense that is lifted up as well. And it says, and the priest or the Kohen shall burn the remembrance portion. Often when you see the idea of incense or the sweet smelling savor, you see the word zakar, which means a remembrance or a memory or a memorial, something to that effect. We know that it's scientifically proven that out of our Five senses, as they say, that we use to experience the external world, that scent, our smell, our, our glands for smelling literally trigger memory more than any of those other senses. So Yahuwah Elohim, he has made us in his likeness, in his image, and therefore the idea of the scent, of the smells, bring forth the idea of a remembrance before Yahuwah, a sweet smelling savor. We go to Devarim, Deuteronomy 26, verse 1. It says, And it shall be when you come into the land which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first of the fruits of the soil which you bring from your land that Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you and shall put it in a basket and go to the place where Yahuwah your Elohim chooses to make his name dwell. And we know that is Yerushalayim, which is called Jerusalem. And you shall come to the one who is Kohen, who is priest in those days, and say to him, I shall declare to Yahuwah your Elohim that I have come to the land which Yahuwah swore to our fathers to give to us. And the Kohen, the priest, shall take the basket from your hand and place it before the altar of Yahuwah your Elohim. And you shall answer and say before Yahuwah your Elohim, My father was a wandering Aramean or a perishing Aramean. And he went down to Mitzrayim and sojourned there with few men. And there he became a great nation, great, mighty, and numerous. And this is talking about both the lives of Abraham and Yaakov. Yaakov, who lived in Padam Aram. Yaakov also has been called Jacob. He was renamed Yasharel, which has been called Israel. And Yaakov, he dwelt in the land of Adam Aram for 21 years. And his mother was the sister of Laban, who is called in the Torah, Laban the Aramean, or the Aramit. So therefore, there is a direct uh, uh, combination of these two bloodlines of the Arameans and the Hebrews or the Abrim, and we see that that is reflected, that Yahuwah Elohim wants them to remember that. Remember where they came from. Remember the forefathers. Remember their sojourns. Remember the things that he swore to them and how he promised to them that he would give them a land that flowed with milk and honey, that it was the promised land. And now the people are in the land reaping of the harvest to present to Yahuwah Elohim and the recounting Yahuwah's favor in their lives since the days of old, since the days of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, who've been called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If we go on further, it says, not only were they wandering Arameans that were perishing in the land, it says they went down to Mitzrayim and sojourned there with few men, and there became a nation great, mighty, and numerous. Because we know Yahusif, who is called Joseph, went into Mitzrayim as a slave, but there he gained favor in the eyes of Pharaoh and was made the right-hand man of Pharaoh. And therefore, in times of famine, his brothers found refuge 
in the land of Mitzrayim, along with their father, Yaakov. And they lived in Mitzrayim, and there they multiplied. And of course, we know that there began to be oppression. And that is what it says right here. It says, but the Mitzrayites did evil to us and afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us. Then we cried out to Yahuwah, Elohim of our fathers, and Yahuwah heard our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And Yahuwah brought us out of Mizraim with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm, with great fear and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now see, I have brought the Bikurim, the first fruits of the land which you, O Yahuwah, have given me. Then you shall place it before Yahuwah your Elohim and bow down before Yahuwah your Elohim and shall rejoice in all the tob or the great which Yahuwah your Elohim has given to you, you and your house and the Levite and the stranger who's among you. So the time of the first fruits is a time of rejoicing, a time to bow down before Yahuwah Elohim, a time to recount how he has always been there and always watched over his covenant and he has done what he has said and he has done what he has sworn to the fathers of old and how he is great and his kindness endures forever and his kindness is everlasting. And as they do this, they rejoice with the Levites and they rejoice with the strangers who are among them, the strangers of the other nations who believe in Yahuwah Elohim. They rejoice at this time as well. But of course, we know that Rashid Katsir, this particular first fruits offering is done by the Kohen. And the Kohen would say this exact oath. And at any time when any person were to bring in the first fruits, they would say this oath exactly as it is recorded in the Torah. So it gives us additional insight and to the time of this offering. Because Yahuwah Elohim has said that this is to be offered up, and it's to be offered up with incense, and that it is a picture of a remembrance. He said that it was in a remembrance, a sweet-smelling savor, and we are to recall all the things that he did. We are to have a remembrance of where he took us, how he took us out of slavery. And he brought us into the promised land. Now let us go to the book of Nehemiah, which is called Nehemiah, chapter 10 and verse 34. It says, And we cast lots among the Kohanim, the priests, and the Levites, and the people for bringing the wood offering into the house of our Elohim, according to our father's houses, at the appointed times year by year, to burn on the altar of Yahuwah, our Elohim, as it is written in the Torah, and to bring the Bikurim, the first fruits of our soil, and the first fruits, the Bikurim, of all fruit of all trees, year by year, to the house of Yahuwah. And also to bring the Bikur, the firstborn of our sons. Remember that word first fruit and firstborn are exactly the same. They are both Bikur. Bikurim is the plural form. And also to bring the Bikur of our sons and our livestock, as it is written in the Torah, and the firstlings of our herds and our flocks, to the house of our Elohim, to the Kohanim, the priests attending in the house of our Elohim. And that we should bring the Bikurim, the first fruits of our dough, which is called Challah, the first portion of the dough is challah. And our contributions and the fruit from all kinds of trees, of new wine and of oil, to the Kohanim, to the priest, to the storerooms of the house of our Elohim, and the tithes of our land to the Levites 
for the Levites should receive the tithes in all our rural towns. So there we see a beautiful uh, just recap of all the Bikurim offerings, all the first fruits offerings that are given to Yahuwah Elohim. And this was during a time right after the Babylonian exile when the house of Yahuwah Elohim was being rebuilt by Zerubbabel during this time. Of course, it was a time of great rejoicing because they had reinstituted the first fruits offering. So they are here. Uh, this is being recounted and you see the excitement and the enthusiasm that they have because they're able, now that they have come out of the land of their exile, they're able to once again offer up the first fruits offering. And in Ezekiel, Yehezekiel chapter 20, we get an interesting prophecy of a future event. In verse 40, For on my Kodesh mountain, on the mountain height of Yashurel, declares the master Yahuwah, there are all the houses of Yashurel, all of them in the land shall serve me. There I shall accept them, and there I shall require your offerings and your bikurim, your first fruits, the first fruits of your offerings, together with all your Kodesh gifts, as a sweet fragrance. I shall accept you when I bring you out from the people. And I shall gather you out of the lands where you have been scattered. And I shall be set apart or Kodesh in you before the Goyim, before the nations or the Gentiles. And you shall know that I am Yahuwah when I bring you into the land of Yashiro. And to the land for which I lifted my hand in an oath to give to your fathers. So we know that Yahuwah Elohim will gather his people in the land of Yashirel, that they will be gathered by a mighty right hand. That Yahuwah Elohim is beginning to unfold these things as we see and we look. We see that Yahuwah Elohim's word is being fulfilled. We know that this is talking prophetically of a future event. That Yahuwah Elohim will gather his people and that they will once again offer up the Bikurim, the first fruits offerings to Yahuwah Elohim, and they will be for a sweet smelling fragrance to Yahuwah. In Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 it reads, And I shall pour out on the house of Dawid and on the inhabitants of Yerushalayim, which is called Jerusalem, the spirit or ruach of favor and prayers. They shall look on me, literally in Hebrew it says, look on me, Aleph Tal, first and last. Again, the picture of the word. Remember, it says of the Mashiach, in the beginning was the word. And we know that this word that was with Elohim are the two letters, Aleph and Tal, which is directly beside the word Elohim in the very first line of the scriptures when it says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. There right beside Elohim is the word Aleph Ta, which is pronounced et, right there in the passage. So here the idea of the first fruits will be linked to the idea of Aleph Ta because it says, they shall look on me whom they pierced. Me, Aleph Ta, whom they pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And they shall be in bitterness over him as the bitterness of over the bikor, over the firstborn. So again, the idea here of the bikor, the first fruits, is directly correlated with the idea of the Messiah, the suffering servant, the idea of his resurrection and his ascension, his being lifted up before Yahuwah Elohim as an offering that had been reaped from the earth and had been crushed and had been beaten and had been prepared with offerings and put through the fire of Yahuwah Elohim. And he did all this, all this so that he could be lifted up as an ascension offering. Yahushua HaMashiach, the Messiah, he rose up to the Shemaim before Yahuwah Elohim on this exact moment and time. He is the Bikor. He is the firstborn. He is the first fruits offering. And he is a picture of every single 
Moed, every single appointed time, and every single word that is written comes from the idea and inspiration that came forth from the heart of Yahuwah Elohim, that came forth from his word, that came forth from the Dabar, that came forth from the Aleph and the Tal, that was with Yahuwah Elohim since the very beginning. In Matith Yahu, Matthew chapter 27, in verse 50 it says, And Yahushua cried out with a loud voice and gave up his ruach. And see, the veil of the dwelling place was torn in two from the top to bottom, and the earth was shaken, and the rocks were split, and the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the Kodesh ones who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the Kodesh, or set-apart city, and appeared to many. Now, what is very beautiful about this particular prophecy, if you remember, that the lambs were sacrificed at the ninth hour. When we read in the context, we know that this was the ninth hour of the day that Yahushua gave up his Ruach. That it equates to roughly 3 p.m. Roman time. And at this moment, it happened on the 14th of Abib. And we know, as we said earlier, that if this was the time when the final Passover lamb was sacrificed and Yahushua gave up of his Ruach, that the Kohanim had gone to the Mount of Olives and there they had bound standing shocks of barley. At the exact moment in time that this happened, there were graves that were marked by being opened. Now notice, they did not raise from the grave until after the master Yahushua rose from the grave because he is the first fruits offering. It all hinges upon him. So we see here the, the same picture here, the same idea that here you see just as the barley stone uh, shocks were being bound. Now these tombs were being marked for resurrection. And on the day that the ascension offering of the Omer, of the uh, what has been called the wave sheaf, of the Omer of the barley, when it's been lifted up to Yahuwah Elohim, at this exact moment in time, Yahushua HaMashiach, the Messiah, presented himself as the ascension offering before Yahuwah Elohim. And there were those who rose up at this moment and appeared to many witnesses in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, as proof of Yahushua's ascension, of his resurrection, or literally his standing, as it has also been translated from the Hebrew. The word standing literally means ami, that he was standing, that he rose. So all these things are so rich in detail when you understand the Torah and the scriptures in their proper context. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, it says, But now Mashiach, or Messiah, has been raised from the dead and has become the first fruit. He has become the bigor of those having fallen asleep. For since death is through a man, resurrection of the dead is also through a man. For as all die in Adam, or Adam, so also all shall be made alive in Mashiach, or in Messiah, and each in his own order. Mashiach, Messiah, the Bikor, the first fruits, and those who are of Mashiach, those who are of Messiah at his coming. And then the end, when he delivers up the rain to Elohim the Father, when he has brought to nothing all rule and all authority and power. So again, the Messiah, who is the Aleph Tal, who Yahuwah says that they will weep for the Bikor, they will weep for him as a firstborn, and they will see him whom they pierced. Now we know that the Mashiach 
is the first fruits. And so therefore, according to what Shaul is teaching, if you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it tells you that we are supposed to honor and keep the Passover. Shaul says that Messiah is the Passover. Therefore, let us observe the feast. So we know that Mashiach died on the 14th day of the month of Abib. He, we know this for certainty because he is the Passover. He is the lamb. But do we understand what Shaul is also telling us? Shaul is telling us that he is the first fruits offering as well. So we have the key to know exactly when Yahushua rose from the grave. In Matithyahu, Matthew chapter 12, verse 39, it says, But he answering said to them, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the stomach of the great fish, so shall the Benadam, the son of Adam, be three days. And three nights in the heart of the earth. And if we go to the book of Jonah, we get the very prophecy. In chapter 1, verse 17, And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So we know that Yahushua, when he died on the 14th of Abib, that it had to be that three days and three nights later would be Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of the barley. So this is very key to understanding for certainty when Rashid Katsir is, but also for understanding the fulfillment of the prophecies in the scriptures. In Jonah chapter 2, Jonah chapter 2, it says, And Jonah prayed to Yahuwah, his Elohim, from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called to Yahuwah because of my distress. And he answered me, from the stomach of the grave I cried, and you heard my voice. That word grave is Sheol. In the King James Version, it's rendered hell. It says he cried out from the depths of hell. But a Sheo, it means the grave. So when Yahushua said that the sign of Yonah had to be fulfilled by the son of man or the Ben Adam, the son of Adam, that he must be in the grave for three days and three nights. That is because Yonah said he was in the grave. He said that he was in Sheo. He was in the grave for three days and three nights. So Literally, we know the heart of the earth. He had to be in the heart of the earth, the grave, Sheol, for three days and three nights. It's mathematically impossible with the Christian model of dying upon what they call Good Friday and raising on Sunday morning. And we're going to see why that's impossible. And also, we know, obviously, that the Messiah's resurrection has nothing to do with the Babylonian deity called Ishtar, which is Easter, which I regret to even have used the name because the Torah says don't utter their names. And this video is about the esteem of Yahuwah. But I just have to bring this up. We know that that model is false. It is faulty. Because you cannot get, even a child can't get three days and three nights out of Friday at any point of the day to Sunday morning. It's mathematically impossible. And I think that if a person can't count to three, I don't know that I want them teaching me anything out of the scriptures. We know it had to be three days and three nights. So therefore, if Yahushua was the first fruits, if he has to be uh, ascended up to the Shema'im before his father, in the heavens, as they call it, Shamaim literally means the space, the expanse, all these various things. If this is the case, then the only model for knowing when Rashid Katsir is the first of the harvest that could possibly work is the clear Torah model. The clear interpretation that the morrow after the Sabbath is talking about the first day of the week and not the 16th 
of Abib, like the Pharisees say. Because you also can't get three days and three nights out of counting from the 14th of Abib to the 16th. The only way that this could be possible mathematically is that Yahushua would have died on the day that the Greco-Roman Empire calls Wednesday. We don't call it that. We call it the fourth day. Yom Arba. But it had to be in such a way so that three days and three nights, the master of the Sabbath, the Adon Shabbat, rose on the Sabbath so that the morrow after he could be presented to his father in the early morning, just like the Kohen Agadol at the third hour of the day, which is roughly 9 a.m., lifts up the offering. We know that the Messiah had to be lifted up. This is the only way to make it work mathematically. It's no other way to make it work. It's, there's just no other way. It's fixed. It's a fixed interpretation. So again, for those of you who are not familiar with this information, you need to understand that you cannot get three days and three nights from the current method that is presented by Christianity. Nor can you get it from the current method that is presented by rabbinical Phariseeism. But what you, get, what you can get it in the Torah the Torah itself, with a literal interpretation, gives you the possibility for the fact that it could be three days and three nights later from the 14th of a beat. So, this is very important because, again, Shaul says that Messiah is the first fruits, and the book of Zechariah, Zechariah said that the Messiah who was pierced would be. A bikor. He would be a firstborn, a first fruit, and that they would weep and, and mourn for him when they saw him. Now, let's take all this and look further at the book of Jonah. In Jonah chapter 2, it says in verse 9, But I offer to you, he's still praying to Yahuwah Elohim in Sheol, and this is what he says, I offer to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I pay what I have vowed, deliverance, belongs to Yahuwah. In Hebrew, is Yahshua Ta La Yahuwah. Yahshua Ta La Yahuwah. This phrase literally means deliverance or redemptions belongs or is unto Yahuwah. And this very phrase is a picture of the Messiah's name because Yahshua is a part of the name Yahushua because the name Yahushua comes from the name of Yahuwah and the word Yahshua, which we see appear together throughout the scriptures. And we've already looked at many of those accounts in the videos on the Passover and unleavened bread and various teachings in this series. But here we see in the grave in Sheol, Yonah gets an idea he gets the, the uh, Ruach HaKodesh that comes upon him, the revelation of Messiah while he's in the grave for three days and three nights. He sees that deliverance is to Yahuwah. Now, when Yonah was spit out onto dry ground, this is obvious, a picture. It is a picture of resurrection. He was dead. He was gone. He was in Sheol. But then Yahuwah Elohim rose him up out of Sheol. But while he was in Sheol, he had the revelation that Yeshua Ta La Yahuwah. And he knew, he had an understanding of the Messiah, of Yahushua, Yahuwah's Yahshua. Okay, now let us go to Matit Yahu, Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. And we'll look at just one of the examples of Yahushua's resurrection. In Matith Yahu 28, verse 1, it says, Now after the Shabbat, toward dawn on the first day of the week, is how it's translated. We're just going to go with that for a minute. Miriam from Magdala and the other Miriam came to the tomb. So if you went off of the literal translation of most of the scriptures, you would come to some type of understanding that the first day of the week is just now beginning 
and Miriam from Magdala is coming to the tomb. And of course, we know when she gets to the tomb, the master has already risen from the grave. So therefore, that alone destroys, destroys the idea of Sunday, sunrise, Ishtar, Babylonian worship, completely annihilates the entire concept. But what is hidden beneath the surface is very beautiful. Because yes, it was the first day of the week, remember. But Rashid Katsir has to be on the first day of a Shavuah cycle, on a weekly cycle. It has to be. So that seven completed Sabbaths and the morrow after gives us 50. So seven times seven, 49. The morrow after is 50. It has to work this way. So it has to be on the first day of the week. But in the Greek, here it says Sabtu, which literally means a Sabbath. And in other places it says Miatan Sabbaton, which means one of the Sabbaths. And in Aramaic it says Chad the Shabbat, which means one of the Sabbath. And it is literally an idiomatic expression that many people are unfamiliar with that refers to the first day of the count of the Omer. The first day of the count of the seven completed Sabbaths that gives us 49 and the morrow after that gives us the 50th day, the day that is called Shavuot, that the Christians and the Greeks, they call Pentecost, the count of 50. So therefore, Miatan Sabbaton, one of Sabbaths, is letting us know it's the first day of the count of Sabbaths for Shavuot. Because the Torah says, count for yourselves, number for yourselves, seven completed Sabbaths. And even in the Aramaic, it calls it Chad de Shabbat, letting you know that it is one of the Sabbath, one of the count of Sabbaths. It's very specific. And this is the day, none other than the day, Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of each and every year. And this is the day that the Messiah rose. And this is the day to the exact hour again that that offering of the Omer is lifted up as an ascension offering. Let's continue in the scriptures. It says in verse 17, Yahushua said to her, speaking to Miriam, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Remember when it's translated, when the term wave sheaf is translated, it should literally mean an ascending offering, an ascending Omer. And here it says, Yahushua says, I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my Elohim and to your Elohim. So if we have the timing correct, we would understand that Yahushua was in the grave for three days and three nights. And then at that moment, right before the Shabbat, the Sabbath had ended, the master of the Sabbath rose on the Sabbath. And he was already risen when Miriam from Magdala came on Miatan Sabbaton, on one, the first day of the count of the Sabbaths, the seven completed Sabbaths, and the morrow after being Shabuot, the Feast of Weeks. So it's very specific. He rose on the Sabbath. He ascends to the Father as an ascension offering before his Father at the exact moment. Remember, it was early in the day. When is the ascension offering of the Omer given? It is given in the morning at roughly 9 a.m. on the Roman clock, three uh, on the sundial, three degrees on the sundial. So Yahushua did this in the morning at the exact moment. And remember that this offering, it had to be beaten and it had to be burned, but it had to be raised. Yahushua, as the first fruits offering, he had to be beaten. He had to go through the fire and he had to be lifted up. And he is the Kohen Haggadah, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, which has been called Melchizedek. Melchizedek literally means my king of righteousness. 
According to Tehillim or Psalm chapter 110, Yahuwah has made an oath to Dawid that his master would sit on the right hand of Yahuwah and that he would be a Kohen forever, a priest forever after the order of Malki Zedek, after my king of righteousness, who is also the king of Shalom, the king of what has been called peace or well-being and wholeness and all these things in one word and more. In Yaakob, which has been called James, but his name is Yaakob, in chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every Tob gift, or every good gift, and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no change nor shadow of turning. Having purposed it, he brought us forth by the word of truth. For us to be a kind of bickerim, of first fruits of his creatures. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Who is the likeness of the invisible Elohim, the bickor, the firstborn of all creation? Because in him were created all that are in the Shemaim and that are on the earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or rulerships or principles or authorities, all have been created through him and for him because Yahuwah Elohim made all things through his words. He spoke and they came to be. So it says that all came through him. And it says, and he is before all in whom all hold together. And he is the head of the body, the assembly who is the beginning, the bickor, the firstborn from the dead, that he might become the one who is first in all. So just like Adam who, who erred and therefore sin and transgression and death be, began to consume humanity, now one who comes from Adam, the Messiah himself, has to go through death and be resurrected so that we can be first fruits because he is a first fruits offering. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 3, And they sang a renewed song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one was able to learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. They are those who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are those following the Lamb wherever He leads them on. They are redeemed from among men, being bikurim, or first fruits, to Elohim and to the Lamb. And this is speaking specifically of the 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Yashorel, which will be sealed in the forehead with the name of Yahuwah, and they shall be first fruits offerings before Yahuwah Elohim in the latter times. We are all called to be first fruits. Just as the Mashiach has been lifted up, we are to go through the resurrection and to be lifted up. We must put our belief and our endurance in the Ben Adam and the Son of Man and the Son of Adam and believe in the true narrow way and understand that he is not only the Lamb of Yahuwah, but he is also the first fruits of Yahuwah. He is the one who came forth. He is the King, the Sovereign that Yahuwah Elohim has anointed to be Mashiach. And he will be anointed and he will rule and reign from Zion, from Zion. And he will build the house of Yahuwah according to the scriptures. And he shall establish it. And the Torah shall go forth from Mount Zion as the prophets have spoken. But we have to understand the prophetic significance of Rashid Katsir of the first of the harvest, to understand the richness of the firstborn and how the firstborn is the first fruit and how it is all relative and how it is all a picture of one another. Yahushua, not only being a firstborn male, but being a picture of the grain offering of the first fruits of the abi barley 
that had to be roasted with fire and lifted up by the Kohen Haggadah who had been anointed with the Kodesh oil. All of this points to the Messiah, to the day, to the hour, to the moment in time. But I want you to remember in closing that Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of barley, does not stand alone. It is connected by seven completed Sabbaths. And the morrow after gives us Shavuot. It gives us the Feast of Weeks. Again, it has been called a count of 50 in Greek. Even a further testimony, the fact of it being the 50th day from this offering, from the offering of the Omer of Abib Barley. So in the next study, we are going to pick up from this day, from the first day of the count of the Omer to the final day. So we are going to go through the seven completed Sabbaths, the counting of the Omer, and the morrow after we are going to learn about. And that day is a very special day a day of a first fruits offering, but this time not the first fruits offering of the Abib barley, but the first fruits offering of wheat from the land of Yasharel. And this time the people won't be eating unleavened bread during this time, but rather the actual offering that is lifted up before Yahuwah Elohim will be two loaves that are leavened. We are going to discover all of the beauty that is Shavuot. But there is no way that we can understand when Shavuot is or the richness and depth and beauty and prophetic insights of Shavuot, which has been called Pentecost, without understanding this day, which has been called a minor feast day, which I think we have all discovered is actually a major appointed time that is called Rashid Katsir, the first of the harvest of the Abib barley. Yahuwah barak you and keep you, and I pray that you will continue to watch the videos in this series, the series of the Feasts of Yahuwah. Shalom, shalom. I know that was really in depth and uh, a lot of good stuff. Like I said, one of the disclaimers is we don't believe in, in uh, everything that was there, like uh, Rosh Hashanah, which is a Babylonian situation. Um, that was, uh, the, the, <laughs> wow, then it, then they agreed with me. Uh, that's a Babylonian New Year. Um, I even forgot the name of it. Uh, so. Could, if there's any uh, questions or comments according to uh, this uh, teaching, uh, this will be the time to do it. And this is what we're going through next um, as we learned about the uh, wave offering, the, the first of first fruits, which is Yahusha. And then we are first fruits. We will rise with them in the resurrection. Uh, every single thing that has to do with the temple and the sacrificial system he is all of it. We were just kind of mentioning that here as we were watching this. Uh, he's all of them. He's the wave offering. He's the he, he's the he's the Azazel. He's the uh, other goat uh, that they sacrifice for the atoning of sins. He's he's all of it, and and all because he's so massive. All these little things have to point, you know, have to uh, uh, be symbolized uh, every aspect of who he is. And that's how complicated and yet simple he is as well. You know, uh, the dove uh, or the pigeon sacrifice and the piece of cedar wood that's used there and the water and all this stuff. Um, and then we use that uh, to count um, to the uh, Shavuot, um, the 
seven Sabbaths, seven sevenths of Sabbaths. We get 49, and then we add one, and that's 50th, and we're free, Jubilee, um, counting. You know, I know there's still uh, some discussion of when Yahusha actually rose, and you will see through Scripture how uh, that, uh, I know me and Brother Ray were talking about that, and hopefully just clarify, and I may send you some more things on that, um, that he did rise. We don't understand the, uh, the Abib, the mixing of days, um, and that's a, that's a, that's, a concept in scripture, a reality, and Arab. so, or what I say? I said a beep, didn't I? Thank you, Arab, 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 uh, the mixing of days. Thank you, Sister Jean Jeanette, um, and uh, how that in that process, not fully the other days, not the other day, he rose in that time frame, and it wasn't quite the, the new day yet, and then when they actually came, and then the uh, the high Sabbath that was there where they couldn't uh, sell. Or buy, and that's why they didn't go to the spices. And there's a whole bunch of other intricate little details um, that uh, Christianity has missed or don't understand, or purposely those who were the scholars hid and did not share, did not say what it was. You know, they'll say oh, it was a festival. Well, it's a festival. You know, five days yet later from this, oh, that was Pesach or, or unleavened bread, and so forth and so on. So there's a lot to unlearn and to learn. As we go through these th things, they all point to Yahusha, who then turns around and points everything back to Father, who we will, as I uh, read earlier, is going to turn everything back over to him, and Yahusha's reign will then end, and Yahuwah will be supreme over all of creation. In the Shamayim, which is the heavens, and the Aretz, which is the earth, and even underneath the earth, because there's people to rule, and I don't believe it's the dead, because uh, the dead know nothing. So, I'm going to just leave that there. All right. Is there any questions or comments? Another. Okay, we got another. <laughs> and I hope you enjoy your coming uh, uh, Pesach meal and you would do the covenantal meal. Uh, for those who are part of this ministry, uh, be looking at the chats. Uh, we will do. We will be doing our covenantal meal, uh, the the Ari before, uh, and, uh, and and reestablish our if you so choose to uh, reestablish our commitment. Uh, to that um, covenant and then we'll go into uh, uh, Pesach and right into Unleavened Bread. Get your house cleaned out. Remember, it's about active yeast. Something that has been already fermented. Um, not inactive yeast. Not inactive. Something that's been, so if you have bread that's already been fermented but if you have a, a product with yeast in it that's not active, it hasn't fermented anything, you're fine. You're fine. If you have kabucha, which is a drink, uh, a very popular drink, a tea drink, that is fermented. We drink kabucha. We have to get that out the house. Uh, so, uh, you know, a, a sauerkraut, if it's fermented, you have to get that out the house. That is, it will have yeast in it. These these other things that people may not have been uh, thinking about uh, that has yeast in it. Uh, if you have cheese, and, and I'm gonna share that thing about cheese again. Um, cheese has um, a pork enzymes that they use. We just found that out. So cheese is out of the question to eat, period. Um, for us, at, at this day and age, unless you can find a cheese that's either the vegan cheese, um, and I would say be careful with that because that's full of chemicals too, um, as well, you'd be better off just not having it, or finding uh, vegan, or excuse me, um, cheese that has the uh, vegetable enzyme that they use instead. It's going to cost you more. And so, uh, yeah, living this life in the way is um, difficult when you're behind enemy lines where everything, where every way is the way. <laughs> um, they can do anything they want. They can eat anything they want. Um, so it does make it more difficult, but we are definitely reaping the, reaping the benefits of eating a healthier lifestyle, following Yahuwah's ways in every way. We are better people. We're stronger. We're faster. We're, we're, we're spiritual, and we're going to have eternal life in the end. Um, so again, um, uh, from this month on, I'm not, uh, uh, really doing any, I'm not doing any personal counseling. Um, there are some things that are coming up in the ministry, uh, that will be revealed a little bit later. Uh, but it's a, it's a big move of Yahuwah, uh, in this ministry. And so, uh, we're focusing on that right now, myself and the, the leaders, uh, for the season that it needs to be focused in on. And then, uh, we will, uh, come back 
stronger than ever. Excuse me. Oh, oh I'm not even tired. What's oh, I'm hungry. Um, uh, so uh, stronger and better than ever. So uh, we're being obedient to his word. And so uh, be looking uh, for that to come. Uh, again, as I said before, there's some other things that have been on hold. We're going to be doing some um, uh, other segments um, outside of the Shabbat service, which we don't have any other segments outside of that right now, where we're going to be doing... Um, uh, now you judge for yourself. Uh, <laughs> uh, let us reason together. And a segment where it'd be myself and another... Uh, person either the Mishpacha, maybe outside the Mishpacha, uh, where we will reason on scripture and let scripture tell us the truth. And not I feel and I think, or I look at it this way. What is the scripture trying to tell us? And only going by that. And that's something we got to learn. We got to stop going by our feelings and how you, I see it. The scriptures will tell us how to see scripture. Um, you know, we can do that with everything, even with this teaching. Oh, well, I see it this way. Well, it really doesn't have to be the barley. It could be the wheat. That's how I feel. Uh, good for you is the barley harvest. It's not the wheat harvest. It's not the split harvest. It's splint. It's not, uh, 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 whatever other grain, buckwheat harvest. It's none of that. It's only what? It's only the Abib harvest. We have to go by that. So, um, look, look forward to that and some other changes. I'm going to tell y'all the truth right now. I almost hollered. Uh, the wind is blowing through the house, and this thing moved next to me, and I almost, ah! Yeah, I don't know why, but it, it kind of scared me a little bit. And, uh, yeah, I held back. Thank you, Father, for allowing me not to scream on camera. But, uh, it, yeah, that almost got me. Man, I'll be moving like that. Look. Y'all know who I am. You know, my... Yeah, we don't like that. We don't we don't like when things move like that unexpectedly. <laughs> okay. Any was there any still any comments or questions? All right. So uh thanks again for, for uh watching us and listening to us. Um uh, thank you for subscribing and such and I, I look forward to I uh, Sister Jeanette, when will you have that button up for the donations for uh, I should have it in by next service. Okay, by next service be looking for the button to donate uh for cash out for your convenience. Uh, and make it easier uh, for you and uh, so that we can get ministered to more in particular that bike and if you want to give a regular donations to help support the um, the uh, our ministry out in Pakistan and Pastor P's ministry out in uh, India uh, again we do heavily support more of the Pakistan side for they are the ones that need it a little bit more so I would say it's about 90 10 um, if you want to do a split like that it's something around there and uh, Master P is really well funded um, at this point. So uh, again, it may be even ninety. It may be uh, ninety-five five um, at this point. Uh, this is, there's just a greater need over there. So um, all right, I guess we'll close up next week. Um, I believe we're going to be doing sh uh, a teaching on Shabbat. And uh, we'll do that. We kind of had a taste of it right now as it connects with, um, you know, we're going down the line, Pesach, and then Unleavened Bread, uh, Hag Mazal, and then we did Yom Bikarim, Yom Bikarim, uh, First Fruits, and learning Yahusha is the first of the first fruits. And then it kind of touched into Shavuot and the Omar, the Omar, uh, how to count to there, you know, seven, seven weeks of Sabbaths. Which we get 49, 7 times 7 is 49. Then you add 1. Uh, and if you look at the week, uh, you add 1 to that week. And you get the 8th day, which is a new day. Uh, which the 50th day represents freedom. And we'll learn more about that. And we'll learn about our freedom as well. Okay. Any questions in here? Alright. No questions in here? No, no questions? No questions in here? Okay. Alright. Let's pray. And again, prepare your hearts as we come before the Father. Abba Yahuwah, we love you, we adore you, and we thank you for this meal that is so rich. So rich, so filling. Uh, we can't even eat it all up in one sitting. We have uh, to-go boxes to take home with us and uh, go over it again and consume some more. And really taste all the seasonings and really enjoy the texture and 
of this meal that you have prepared for the nourishment of our souls, to draw us closer to you, to understand more of the seasons and times and what they represent. These are all messages, uh, instructions hidden within these things. As your word says that those who draw close to you, you would uh, uh, tell uh, the answers to riddles, enigmas, and things of that nature, the hidden things, Father. And we thank you that you've chosen us to be able to do that, Father. And we ask that those who you may have chosen who choose to go a different way or not take the time and focus their times on things that are meaningless and not eternal, that you would allure them, Father, that you would bring them back onto the ancient path and to give them that hunger and thirst for you and you alone. Father, I ask that for all of us here and those who will hear later on that they're weak, that they would have a show of tov, they would have a good week, a functional week according to your design, that you would guide them as they seek your face, and they would have that desire to be guided by you, that humility. Father, I, I pray that you would influence us to pray more, to pray more, not just for our personal needs, but for others to be interested not in a nosy way not in the wrong way but interested in one another the brothers and sisters the Akhenakites in this ministry and abroad to be, have a concern a sincere concern for the well-being of Mashiach's body just because we're the pinky on the right hand doesn't mean we're not concerned about the left foot, pinky toe. It's because there's a distance far away and even it's on the other side of the world that uh, we would be concerned when it hurts and we would do our best to do something about it. Father, help us to, to step outside of ourselves, out of our realm, out of the things we see, other things that we believe is so daunting on us and, and learn how to shovel each other's burdens even though your word says we're not as individuals to expect that but you also talk to the ones who see those who are heavily laden to go and help them that that would be our heart father we ask for healings of all types heal 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 your people from the top of the head to the bottom of their feet from the inside out from all the damage that has been inflicted upon us or we inflicted upon ourselves. Father, we look forward to next week what you have to speak and what you have to say. We know you speak to each and every one of us together but individually, giving us just what we need when we need it. You are a good Father. And we give you esteem for that and for everything else that you are. And Yahushua's my name, we pray and decree these things. Hallelujah. So let it be, so it shall be. Oh, All right, till next Shabbat. Shalom. Shalom. Yahuwah, we love you. Yahuwah, we need you.